felt like a rock star. They offered me a five year contract, 45 grand a week, 8.8 .8 million that I was earning. Yeah, that's just when all my dreams come true, really. Magnificent goal! Jamie O'Hara! You know, I was the star man. I was the best player there. <laughs> man wow. United, Real Madrid wanted me to go out there and have a trial with them. I was now going Nobu and, and, and going to top restaurants and going out partying and I took my half prizes. But other things that like caught your eye and... Yeah, yeah. women. And that kind of broke me is when I got all the fame and I got the, the money, I didn't have any guidance. You know, like you see these players who have that rise to stardom and then they just fall off a cliff because they don't know how to deal with what yeah. they've got. Yeah. Jaden Sancho, Deli Ali. After that, was it was an absolute disaster. Wow. I fell off a cliff. So they just no. froze you out, basically? Death mm. threats. Like, they wanted to kill me. Gone for a divorce, which cost me £2 million. I haven't got a club. My money's running out. Yeah, so I went on Big Brother. We'll give you 300 grand. That changed everything. I went to interview Harry Kane, and he refused to do an interview with right, me. Okay. People said talk about Van Dyke. You know, I think he's overrated. Former Premier League footballer Jamie O'Hara opens up about the highs and lows of his career and the untold reality about being a pro footballer. Before we get into this, like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. So Jamie, so like most English boys, I grew up absolutely desperate to be a professional footballer, right? Anyone ask me what I want to be a professional footballer? Yeah. And I got to like 13, 14, and you sort of start to realise... You were good enough. I'm not good enough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to happen. I'm just lying to myself. Obviously, you were good enough. Do you remember a moment when you were maybe that age, a bit young, where you thought, you know what, I'm, I'm good enough to do this? Um, I mean, I, I, I kind of started when I was, I was seven. Yeah. And I got scouted playing in a cup final for my Sunday league team. Um, and there was a Chelsea scout there. And I was playing under nines at the time and I remember him coming up to my dad afterwards um, and I was playing left back and he said, you know, your boy, he, he looks pretty good. He's, mm. Would he be interested in coming down and training with the under nines for, for Chelsea? And my dad said, well, he's only seven. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, right, he's definitely coming down to Chelsea. So I ended up, I was at Chelsea from really young age. And that's what kind of where I started um, going into uh, Battersea Park, uh, training there every Tuesday and, and Thursdays, and um, and it, I realised I was I, I realised I was good because I was at Chelsea. You, you, yeah. yeah, I was you know I was at Chelsea and I knew I was good. But I, I asked this question to my dad because I got three boys now, and I always say, Dad, when. When was the moment mm. that, you know, you kind of knew that this is an opportunity? And he always said that it's, I started playing football at school, got in the school team. I was the best player. So I was dad, right, all right, he's, he's, he's the best player at school. And then I went to Dartford district team. I got my dad paid to get me into this Dartford district side because the school wasn't actually in the district at the time. He paid to get me in it because he wanted me to play for him. Yeah. And I went down there and... I scored a hat-trick on my debut. You know, first game, scored a hat-trick for Dartford. That was it. I was the best player at Dartford District. Yeah. So that was a step up. And then I got obviously asked to go and play for the county team, which was Kent at the time. So I went to Kent County and my dad was like, right, let's let's see where he's at now. You know, what this is another step up. Yeah. Went to Kent County, was the best player, running rings around people. And it kind of, every kind of step that I took, I eventually went to Arsenal. Arsenal come and uh, scouted me when I was... Uh, playing for Kent and at the time Arsenal was the best academy in the country right Arsenal mm -hmm. Man United they were the best yeah and I took the opportunity to go there and I was the best player there <laughs> you know like everywhere I went I kind of was like yeah you know and I, I once I got to kind of 11 12 my dad was like right you know he, he's pretty good at this stuff and he kind of you know he dedicated his whole life really for me to you know, pursue my dream of becoming a footballer, but I was obsessed, you know, I was just addicted to football. I lived and breathed every single day was just football, football, football. And, you know, for me, the Arsenal Academy was the one where like, you were, you were at the top of any academy in the country. And I was um, just really trying to, you know, kick on with my, my ability there. And at every single age group, every year I stepped up, I continued to be the best player in that team. And, you know, I just, I was just addicted to it. Loved so it. did you think at that point you were going to go and play for Arsenal? Obviously you ended up playing for Spurs. That was a bit, that's a bit of a, a left <laughs> yeah. field turn. How did that happen? Um, I mean, for me, I always, people ask me like, how did you make it? And I'm like, it, it, it sounds a bit stupid and it's not an arrogant thing. I just always knew I was going to be a footballer. Yeah. Yeah. Like I just, I, I, I just had no, there was nothing else. Yeah. Like I was going to be a footballer 
I always said getting to the top was the easy bit. Stanware was the, was mm. the bit where I struggled with. Um, making it was just, I was obsessed. I was obsessed. And, you know, I was always like, no one was going to stand in my way in terms of me realising my dream and plan. Yeah, At the time, it was for Arsenal. You know, yeah. I believed that I was going to play for Arsenal. Yeah, they were yeah. the best side. It was the best academy. They loved, mm. Arsenal loved me. Mm. Like, I was like their... You know, their one that was coming through, who was everyone was talking about, I was playing for England. You know, I was the one that was representing Arsenal for, for England at that age group. And every year I stepped up and it got to, uh, I, I got to 16. I was at Arsenal school. So 11 kids went to an Arsenal school and there was a few of us there. I was the one that was kind of really looking, they were pushing on. I was starting to train with the reserves, uh, some of the first team players as well. Arsene Wenger obviously knew where I was. Mm. Um and I looked to sign up after school was to then go full-time pro with yeah. Arsenal Academy. Um, and I had a, a, my dad actually, and, and me as well, had a falling out with Liam Brady. Okay. Who was a legend there, but he was like yeah. the sporting director, the academy director. And we fell out of him because I said I, I, was, I was 17. I was playing in the England age groups with Tom Huddleston, Gabby Agbonglahor, Theo Walcott. Um, you know, Aaron Lennon. I was playing with players that were already playing first team football. Yeah. Like they were just started to get in, like Tom Huddleston was playing for Derby. Uh, there was, there was, and I was like, I want to play. I'm, you know, I thought I was ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wasn't ready, <laughs> but I thought I was ready because yeah. as you do, you, you know, you don't want to get held back. Yeah. And it was just at that, eight, that it was just at that time where young players were really trying to, you know, get in the first team early. And so Liam Brady was like, look, Arsenal, we love you. We want you to come in. You're going to be in the reserves. We're going to develop you. We see you plan for Arsenal. You're going to have a great career here. Mm. But we don't see you getting in the team until you're 21. Uh, and I was like, I'm 17. I'm yeah. not waiting four years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, nah. So Liam Brady, obviously, was he was quite a stubborn character. Uh, a brilliant man. A stubborn character. So we kind of called their bluff a little bit and was like, all right, well, I'll leave then. And obviously, when that happened, that was a kind of a big decision to make because all of a sudden then I had every team in the country want to sign me because I was obviously representing mm. you know Arsenal and, and, and playing for England and I was available yeah. that was you know was and a right age profile at yeah that point. age yeah, yeah. and then at that time it was but I was a Tottenham fan right so okay. I used to go down to the JVC centre at Highbury and train with Arsenal I used to wear a Tottenham shirt <laughs> <laughs> so so it was okay. a bit yeah so I was <laughs> always I was, confident then <laughs> yeah I was yeah I was confident but I was always growing up as a Tottenham fan I remember getting letters come through the door. I think I probably had 15 different letters from 15 different clubs. Man wow. United, Man City, um, Tottenham, Chelsea again wanted me back. And then there was like Wimbledon. And then there was uh, Real Madrid that wanted me to go out there and have a trial with them. Wow. But I never wanted to leave home. I was very much a homeboy. I lost my mum when I was 17. So I was going through that period where yeah. my mum was going through cancer. And mm. I wasn't, Man Manchester United really wanted me to go up there, but I didn't want to leave home. I would have had to stand digs. Mm. I never wanted to do digs. So Tottenham was the perfect opportunity, really. I thought, I'm a Tottenham fan. I love it there. I went and trained with the first team. They brought me in and was like, we're training with it because they had to pay a fee for me. Now, I don't mm. know how much that fee was, but I heard it was around a million pound. Right. Um, depending on whether I play, if I got in the first team, there would be add-ons. Um, and... I went into the first team. I loved it. I loved being around it. And straight away, I, I pursued going to Tottenham and, and made that happen. And kind of the, the rest is history. But the funny story is, is, is that I went to Tottenham on the basis that I didn't want to wait till I was 21 to get in the first team at Arsenal. And I made my debut for Tottenham when I was 21. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a few loan moves in there, weren't there? Um, so just on that decision of where to go and you went to Tottenham. Yeah. If you had that again, would you make a different decision? Same thing. So the fancy Real Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, look, the Real Madrid and Manchester United ones. I look back on and go, yeah. them opportunities probably don't come around very often. Yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to live in Diggs, and I wouldn't have wanted to move to Spain. I could have gone to Real Madrid, had a trial, and it not worked out. Yeah, and I could have yeah. gone out there, disappeared, and no one know who I am. Yeah. I have to say that I made the right decision because I made it as a footballer in the Premier League for Tottenham, who are a massive club, and it was my boyhood dream to play for Tottenham. I always wanted to play for Tottenham. Right. Um, it was a big decision and obviously because of my mum passing away and, and around that time where she was ill, I wanted to be at home. I, mm, I wanted to yeah. be around my family. So that in terms of having a regret over that decision, no. Yeah. But 
you, you never know, do you? Yeah. You know, you, you never know. You, you can't tell what would happen. You, you can't tell what yeah. could happen. You can't live in in regret. Um, but yeah, Real Madrid would have been a <laughs> would have been a good uh, would have been fun. Maybe. Would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> so you go to Spurs, and then there's a number of loan moves. Is yeah. that frustrating? Are you like, oh, I really want to stay here and play? I hated it. Yeah, I hate it. I mean, look, the first one was to Chesterfield. I went out on loan. I was, I think, I was 18. I went out on loan and. I didn't want to play reserve team football anymore. I was like, I need to go and experience men's football. I need to know yeah. what it means where, you know, lads are playing in League One. They're not on loads of money. They're paying for their, their mortgage and their families. Like, you have to go and... It means something. You know, you're playing in the reserves and it's a development team. It don't mean at all. Yeah. Um, you just, you know, you go and turn up and you play and if you lose, you lose. And, oh, yeah, well played. We learn from this. When, you, when I went to Chesterfield, it was like three points or off right okay. you know like you have to win yeah and that was my first taste of real football and Roy McFarlane was the manager and he was old England centre half old school manager and he was brilliant loved it, it was a massive learning curve for me and it was it, the first loan move to Chesterfield was brilliant I think I scored six or seven goals in 15 games mm. um, and that's when I kind of I was like I know I can be a professional footballer yeah whether it's in the Premier League I know I can be a professional footballer mm. at, at a level, League One, Championship. I knew I could make it. And that then gave me the confidence. When I went back to Tottenham, I was like, right, I'm going to kick on. I didn't. Hmm. I, I really got frustrated because it was a time where Tottenham brought in a, uh, a new sporting director, Damien Camoli, and he was just bringing in so many players. Right. It was like, they were just, they were just like, I, I ended up saying it was like a brick wall in terms of progression does your heart sink then when you because I imagine you hear about it in news like other people I imagine when it's first being Ruben you're thinking oh don't bring him in don't yeah. bring him in it's going to stop it was me. every week it yeah. felt like every week they were bringing in someone every week and they weren't bringing in like star players at this time they were just bringing in like players that were coming into the reserves right you no know, potential young players filling the squads up like we're just filling the squad up with players mm. and some of them made it through I mean some of them made it uh, and, and got in there but I was like I've signed for Tottenham because I knew this was going to be an easier pathway in terms of Arsenal because Arsenal mm. at the time had yeah. Emmanuel Petit and Vieira playing in the <laughs> midfield, you know? So I, had, I saw it as an easier pathway to get into the first team and then they kind of just, they blockaded it for me and I got really frustrated and I remember knocking on the door, Martin Yole, all the time saying, I want to play, I want to play, I need to be involved and he was like, calm down, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're fucking Ed Dean, yeah? You're, what the fuck is this? <laughs> off like I'm knocking on his door every week he don't even know the f I am <laughs> and uh, but I thought I was good enough I was ready yeah I ended up going on loan to Mirwall um, which again was a family uh, um, club that I knew you know like, all my family from Bermondsey right they all grew up as Mirwall fans Mirwall and Tottenham are massive in my family so I was like yeah I'll go to Mirwall you know my family know it but it would be good for my family to see me play for them I went there and Actually, it, it went okay. It went really well. Um, I had one incident where I, I, I had a bit of a nightmare. I, I don't know. You've probably seen this online. Was I had a, I had a, a row with a manager away mm. at Carlisle. I'll never forget this story. I learned a lot from it, to be honest. I was 18. And I, was, I wasn't arrogant, but I was confident in my ability. And I, I was at Mirwall for a reason. I wasn't there because I wanted to play for Mirwall. I was there because I wanted to progress my career. That's mm. what loan people do, right? Yeah. And I got dragged after 30 minutes. We we're 3-0 down. The manager dragged me after 30 minutes. Willie Donerke, I'll never forget his name. Absolute clown. And he, he pulled me off. And I walked off the pitch, took my shirt off, which I shouldn't have done. It was stupid. And I fucking walked in the dressing room and was like, f*** this, I'm off. And I, got, I, I, I walked to the train station in, from Carlisle, right? I'm 18 years of age. I've got no money on me. I haven't got a <laughs> clue where I am. I was <laughs> seething. I've, like, this is, it come to this. So I remember walking to Carlisle train station, I got on a train and I only had enough money to get me to Birmingham. <laughs> I had to get back to London. <laughs> so I've ended up, and I'll never forget it, Neil Harris phoned me, he's the captain. He's phoned me, where are you? I'm like, I'm fucking gone, f this, I'm off. I'm fucking not, I'm going back to Tottenham. So I've left at half time, bad, bad decision. Yeah. My dad had to come and pick me up from Birmingham. <laughs> I've gone back next day, you know, I've had Tottenham on the phone. What's going on? I was like, I ain't going back. Literally an hour later, they sacked the manager, Mirwall. So Willie Donnelly got the sack because he was having a beast anyway. Yeah. Sacked the manager. So now I've gone back to Tottenham, but I'm still technically on loan at Mirwall. So I'm training at Tottenham for three or four days. And um, Kenny Jackett phones me 
and says, do you want to come back? I know what's happened. Put it in the past. I want a fresh start. I want you. I need you. I want you to, I, I need right. you to play. I want you to play Saturday. I'm going to start you. Wow. So I was like, yeah. So I've gone back to Mirwall and Kenny Jackett said, look, I'm going to play you. Don't care what's happened. Willie Donerkey didn't rate you or whatever. Fine. I got a massive fine from Tottenham. I got two week, two week wages fine. I learned a lot from it. I apologised to all the Millwall players. It was out of order on my part. I was young and naive. Played that, played that Saturday, scored. And the rest is history. I kind of, from then, I played six or seven games under Kenny Jacket. And then Martin Yole got sacked at Tottenham. Hmm. And one day Ramos come in. They brought one day Ramos in. And... My loan ended at Mirwall and I could either go back, to stay at Mirwall till the end yeah. of the season or go back. One day Ramos said, I want everyone back. He didn't have a fucking clue I was. Yeah. I want everyone back who have got a first team number because um, I want to see what the squad is, yeah. what, what the squad's saying. Ended up going back and within a week, Mirwall phoned up and said, we want Jamie back for the rest of the season. And... and uh, Gus Poyet come up to me, who was the assistant manager who one day brought in. I said, I'm going to go back to me. He went, no, you ain't. You ain't you're not going back. I went, what do you mean? He went, manager loves you. You're going to be involved at the weekend. And I was like, fuck off. I was like, oh, <laughs> fucking wind me up. He went, no, you've been training unbelievable. You're fit. He's yeah. massive on fitness. Yeah. Doesn't think the midfield's fit enough, but he sees you and you're fit. And that was it. Weekend, I was involved. I was on the bench at home first game against Manchester City. And I was on the bench and I didn't get on, but he was he wanted to put me on. And I could see, like, fuck, I've got an opportunity. I'm going to play. Mm -hmm. And then the following week, we played against Portsmouth away uh, at Fratton Park. And, yeah, that's just when all my dreams come true, really. Yeah. yeah. What was that? I mean, what was that like? That must be a crazy moment. I mean, I, I don't really talk... I only really ever talk about it in a podcast, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. But it's a moment that lives forever... Yeah. And when I talk about it, I get emotional about it <laughs> yeah. because it is the ultimate moment for any person who wants to be a footballer. Like yeah. my dream was to play for Tottenham. I'd gone through all that hardship. I'd lost my mum. I'd gone through family problems, you know, trying to fight through that situation, sticking together as a group. My dad dedicating his whole life to try and get me to a point. Yeah. And that was that point. Yeah, I was warming up. One day Ramos, Gus Poyet, shout down to the line. I'm a frat and it's tight, Fratton Park. We were playing um, and he's like, Jamie, you're coming on. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to actually walk on a football pitch in the Premier League for Tottenham yeah. in Hotspur. Like, my, like, this is like, yeah, yeah. you know, I don't care what anyone says, you can have many fuck ups in life and I've had plenty of them, <laughs> right? But I walked on a football pitch for my boyhood club and I'll never forget that moment, goosebumps, walking on the pitch, turning around, seeing my family in the crowd, my dad was there, my auntie was there crying their eyes out yeah. and I could always spot my family in the crowd I could always I could always where I was where I was at Fratton Park where I was at some dog and duck cup or I was playing at Wembley for some reason I could just always spot where my family were I guess sometimes though, things like a Premier League debut you don't want to see him because you're like oh I might get all emotional here I need to keep it I together. did get emotional I, yeah, yeah. I was emotional I was, <laughs> I'm thinking F I'm emotional walking on the pitch but like, when you walk on the pitch, everything changes. You go into a different mindset. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. You, as soon as you walk across that white line, and that for me, walking over the white line for me was always like foot, that football pitch was my sanctuary. Mm. Like all my problems just mm. disappeared. No, however, in life, different stages in life that I've had where I've had off the field incidents and problems or I've been down, as soon as I walked onto a football pitch, I just always felt at ease. I just always felt comfortable. And it, the debut went amazing. I set up one of the, we set up, we won two, one, I set up one of the winners. Um, and next, the next week I started against Arsenal Wow. at the Emirates, wow. which was my full debut for Tottenham, which yeah. was just, again, fucking unbelievable, you know? I'll get back to my conversation with Jamie in a second. Before I do, I just want to quickly let you know that if you're a business owner, marketer, entrepreneur, you're running ads online and you want significantly better results than what you're currently getting, my business can help you do that. We create, manage and optimize ad campaigns for our clients. If you're interested in finding out more, you can click on the link in the video description below. That'll take you through to a page on our website where you can book in a free call with one of my team members. Hopefully we get a chance to work together. Were you like, was it one of those where sometimes you want these things to happen, but you want them so much that you're really nervous and you're almost sort of conflicted a bit like I really want to play but I'm nervous was there any of that or were you just like no just chuck me in there I'm good to go I want to do it I was always just throwing the deep end right, yeah. I've, I've, I've been like that with everything 
throw me in the deep end and I'll figure it out. Yeah. You know, like I still think I could play in the Premier League now. <laughs> now, just throw me in, give me 20 minutes, I'll do a job. <laughs> Warm up, <all> good. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was, I never, football was my talent. That's all I ever knew. You know, like I, I, I didn't know anything else. Mm. And I was always kind of just tunneled vision. When I was young, I was just so tunneled vision. And I look back now and I'm like, I'm kind of proud of myself really because there's, you see it a lot where you see footballers who were good footballers, and I knew loads of good footballers, but didn't make it because they didn't have that tunnel vision. Right, yeah. I had a drive and a determination from a young age to, I didn't really have too many friends. I didn't have many friends. I didn't hang out. I didn't go out. I didn't drink. Mm. I was never seen out. I changed when, <laughs> changed when I got a big contract, but um, <laughs> I was very tunnel visioned into being like, when I walk on a football pitch, I'm going to do it. I didn't give a who I was playing against. I was going to be better than you. And then, Obviously, I played against Paul Scholes and Gerard and Ronaldo and realised, yeah, I'm not that good. <laughs> you I'm, finally reached a point where you weren't the best yeah, in, in, yeah. In, in, in the game. I yeah, still yeah. thought I was. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still thought I was, but yeah, I mean, you know, one, once you realise you come up against, you know, Steven Gerrard, Paul Scholes. The best in the world. The best in the world. Yeah. You know, Ronaldo. You know, I, I actually played well against Ronaldo and he scored two goals that day. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there was a few moments where I've played against players where I'm like, you know. Yeah, right, this is the different level. So, so once you got to that point, then you must be thinking, "I'm going to be playing for Spurs for the next ten years." Yeah, this is me. I'm going to, I don't know, four hundred appearances or whatever. Yeah, um, is that what you were thinking? And then, obviously, it didn't quite go like that. No, tell me about that. That next stretch, then. How, how so, did that go? Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's it. Your, your, your dreams made, really. And then it's like, right what's the next goal? Mm. And, you know, as I got older, I started to do visualizations and manifesting stuff. And you don't, you don't realize actually when you're a kid, a lot of, you, you don't realize how, how much visualizing you're doing when you're being a footballer, you know, like that, right. that vision, the tunnel vision to, yeah. you're visualizing a goal. I'm I used to dream about being a footballer. I used to dream about playing for Tottenham. I used to dream about football matches before they even happen. Yeah. You know, I, this, that, like that's what used to happen. I, when you're a kid, you don't realise what that is. You're not thinking you're doing some sort of you, technique. To no, help there's no technique. Achieve, you're yeah, just yeah. you're just doing it. But actually, that you are. You're manifesting what you're going to be doing mm. as you move on. And I think the problem I had was I reached the goal, right, of what my childhood was was to be a footballer. So once I reached the goal, I needed to set another goal, but I, and I didn't. It was then mm. the goals changed for me a little bit. I loved, I was playing, I, I was made it, I was a part of the squad. I got a, a really nice contract. Tottenham put me on a, I think it was a four or five year deal, 25 grand a week. Yeah. You know, I'm 21 years of age. <laughs> you know, I'm getting a million pound a year. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, um, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> you know, like where are we going? And that's kind of where maybe I look back and go, I took my eye off the prize a little bit. And look, I was... I was still involved at Tottenham. I was playing, but Harry Redknapp come in. One day, Ramos got the sack. Harry Redknapp come in. And I'll never forget Harry Redknapp come up to me. Your first day, I'll never forget it. Come up, put his arm around me. He said, do well for me, son. I'll make sure you get a, a, a right good contract. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he said, you're on shit money compared to some of the others. At the time, I was on like seven grand a week. Right, okay. Which is amazing money. But yeah. in, the, in the day and age, uh, Peter Crouch and Defoe were there on 60 grand a week. Yeah. So, you know, I, he was like, put, he put, and, he, and he did. And you know what? I did. I'd done well for him. I was involved. You know, I had some really good moments, Carabao Cup semifinals. And, you know, I was involved in the team all the time, not starting every week, but I was always involved. And he gave me that big contract, 25 grand a week. And that's when things, I would say, potentially changed in terms of my tunnel vision broadened out to different apps, you know, different, different things. But other things that like caught your eye and... Yeah, yeah. women. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean... You're yeah. that age, you've got all that money. Yeah. You've got the attention, inevitable. Yeah, like, yeah, of course. So many people go down that road, don't they? Of course. I, I yeah. never forget the moment when I started for Tottenham, all of a sudden, all the girls that used to not talk to me because they didn't have a fucking clue I was and just thought I was a, like some little idiot from Dartford. Yeah. Saw me playing for Tottenham at, you know, <laughs> yeah. at, at Wembley and, and at the Emirates and all of a sudden they start messaging again and... Yeah it become very much like you are a rock star. Yeah. I felt like a rock star, yeah. you know, and all of a sudden I'm buying a, you know, a million pound house. Mm. I'm driving around in, you know, a, a Range Rover Sport, you yeah. know, which, you know, and I'm, I'm looking to think, right, what can I spend? And instead of being at home with me mates playing table tennis, 
I was now going Nobu and, and, and going to top restaurants and going out partying. And I was still very dedicated. But when I look back, I wasn't, I, I, I took my, I took my half the prize. You said your dad was really important in getting you to be in a professional in the first place. At that time, was he a voice saying to you, you've got to calm it down, keep your focus? No. Or is he letting you do your thing at that point? My, I never listened to my dad. Right. I mean, like, I love him. I love it. Like, I love him to death. Right. He's my, my best mate. He still yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't can listen to him. You know, like he, he 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 dedicated his life to get me to where I'm that point. Yeah, but I was like, F off, Dad. You know, the the person I listened to the most was my mum. Right. Okay. My mum passed away, and that yeah. she, you know she died of cancer when I was 17, when I was just on the verge of making it, and that kind of broke me. I realised further down the line how much that affected me and put me into um, a state where I was kind of. It, it gave me. It was. A blessing and, and, and also kind of as I got older, it was, a, it, it was a bad thing because it gave me the tunnel vision to be like, no one's fucking stopping me. I'm right. going to make it as a footballer. Yeah. You know, for my mum, that's it. I'm going to, no one's getting in my way. I will go through anyone. Yeah. And, but what it didn't do is when I got all the fame and I got the, the money, I didn't have any guidance. I had no guidance at all. Okay. You know, like I didn't have someone saying to me, you shouldn't be doing that or you know, fucking get your head straight. Yeah. You know, my mum used to give me a little pinch under the arm when I was a kid and be like, fucking sort yourself out. Right. You know, like, and yeah. I, and I lost that when, when I lost my mum and my dad was very much obviously there supporting me. Yeah. But he was going through, of course, you know, really hard time he lost his, well. he lost yeah, his yeah. wife, right. For 30 years, we were a proper close family. Yeah. You know, we were me, my brother, my mum, my dad, and we had a family with network around us, but we were one yeah. team. And he went through a really bad time. And, you know, there was lots of times where, you know, I'm playing a game on the Saturday and I'm thinking about my dad driving down to Dover and he's going to drive off a cliff. Right. You know, okay. so we were going through, you know, a really difficult spell. And and this is at the same time, really, that you're becoming this professional footballer, becoming this rock star. Yeah. That's so much to deal with. In so all, much pressure. All in a very short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was literally like the biggest amount of pressure on someone's shoulders who really who's, I'd always just been a kid yeah like, I, you know like I, I I didn't come from like a, a broken background I had an amazing upbringing you know I was protected by my family yeah um and you know I'd kind of always you know kind of always been really easy to go through life and just concentrate on football and all of a sudden yeah I you know there was obviously lots of issues going on behind the scenes and and reasons where I was burying my head in the sand and you know, trying to get through and trying to live a, a life and which was make, trying to make myself happy. And in fact, really, I'd lost my mum to cancer and, you know, I was I was really down about it. And, you know, I missed her. And she had she didn't get to see me become yeah. that famous footballer. Yeah. She, she died just before that moment. That must have been tough. I mean, if you'd have been 10 years older, not only would you have been able to deal with it probably a lot better just because you're that much more mature. Yeah. And also you'd have had those moments where your mum does get to see you. Yeah. The, obviously the sacrifice that she will have put in as well as your dad of to course. get you there yeah. yeah that must have been really difficult yeah it was it was a killer um and yeah i mean it was literally like i'd got to 17 years of age with a family support network and then lost that that key member yeah and i, I had to then kind of figure it out on my own from there and you know i've done all right i've done all right yeah, you know yeah, like yeah. I'm, I, I figured it out yeah um in, in football sense, you know, I made it and had a, 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 an amazing career in terms of where I'd come from. You know, and I always say this, like, if you make it in the Premier League, you know, there's so many people that play in the Premier League and there's, you know, pundits, even myself, ah, if he's, you know, he's not good enough, right? Yeah. As a footballer, I respect anyone that's made it as a professional footballer at the highest level. Such the because upper crust, isn't it? To it, just even get there, it's so not, five minutes. Not point not one percent yeah, of yeah. people ever make it to be yeah. a footballer, and they're people that play football. Yeah. So out of the people that even play football, not point not one percent of them make it. Yeah. And so, so so to be that percentage, whether you're good enough or not, you've made it. Yeah. So someone's thought you're good enough to give you that opportunity to play in the Premier League, and that is an unbelievable achievement. Mm. And I always respect any footballer that's, you know, dedicated themselves and sacrifice that they've made to get to that point. And whether they, and the ones that keep going and keep pursuing and, and win and go on to be, you know, world-class players, they're just unbelievable to me. Yeah. Like they're, you know, what achievements they've, they've got. And it's not easy, you know, cause there's so many setbacks you have to go through, so many things you have to overcome to get through it. And 
You know, there's so many times when you can throw the towel in and think, fuck, fuck, I'll do something else. Yeah. You know, one of my best mates is still my best mate now. Played alongside me at Arsenal. He's a centre midfield player. He's a really good player. Played all the age groups, same as me. We were the two best players. He never made it. Yeah. But I did. And because I, I just had the vision, I had the tunnel vision and he, did, he, he didn't, he lost his way. He maybe had his head turned or whatever earlier than what you did. Yeah. You'd already got to the point yeah. where you so were established. The, yeah, so by the point where I was kind of taking my eye off the prize, <laughs> I'd already given myself a platform yeah. to be a professional footballer by that point. You know, yeah. I was going to I was gonna have a career in football. Yeah. Um, I could have had a better career and I should have had a better career. Um, but I'd already given myself the chance that, you know, someone else would have took a chance on me. Do you think at that point where you're maybe not as focused as you were, there should have been someone at the club mm. trying to be that person who's like, I mean, you mentioned Harry Redknapp, but it's mm. around you. Do you yeah. think he should have maybe done a bit more or someone else should have done a bit more and been like, come on, pal, this is like, you know, we've seen this road before. Yeah. We know what this looks like. If you do it this way instead, you'd be better off with a lot. I think there were, there's not, it wasn't at the time as much there is now. Like right. now, there I think there's a lot better support network, but you still see it. Yeah, you know, yeah. players who completely fuck it up. Yeah. Jaden Sancho, Deli Ali, you know, like you see these players who have that rise to stardom and then they just fall off a cliff because they don't know how to deal with what yeah. they've got. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess I was kind of look. Maybe I needed a father figure in mm. in the game at that time, and um. I kind of felt uh, Harry Redknapp was that at the start for me. He's he's seen as that character, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, and that he was sort of person, and yeah. he really was that for me at the start. He had, he did have his arm around me, um, but you know he's not my dad. Yeah, at the end of the day, he's a manager of a football club, and he's yeah. got to get results. And I wasn't pulling my weight, and then he saw saw me going out with Daniel Lloyd, getting pictured out at fucking Nobu, yeah, a day after a game, and and he started to look, and he, he gave me some he gave me some warnings. Yeah. He gave me warnings. You know, there was a few times when I was playing and then he'd, he'd saw a picture of me or saw a picture of me out. And next day I was training with reserves. Right. You know? And when you're young, you kind of have a bit of an arrogance to you. Go, oh, fuck off. It's fine. I can yeah, do what I want. I'll deal with it. I, yeah. I know. I'm not, you know, I'm in a relationship with someone who's in a high profile. I'm not doing anything wrong. You know, like I'm not partying. I'm not going yeah. out getting drunk and falling out of nightclubs. I was going out for meals, but I was getting pictured out. Right. And in that that time, it was very it was frowned. It's different now. It's frowned upon. I think back then it was a bit like nah, don't don't want that. Managers did didn't want it. I think now because footballers are so big now, they kind of have to accept it. Yeah, like it's, that's just how it is. Yeah. Um, but it was at that time it was still very much like no, you can't get away with that. And I I made the mistake of falling into that trap. Mm. So you mentioned, obviously, like as your career went on, you had some setbacks. One that comes to mind would be Carabao Cup final, miss a penalty. Was that... Oh, fucking hell. Is that... So that reaction, is that something that's still, like... Still a sleepless night over it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I still think about that moment and think, you wanker. <laughs> did, it, did it affect you, like, in the immediate aftermath of that? Uh, no. Like, day to day? No. No, I mean, obviously, I lost sleep. Like, right. I didn't sleep for two weeks. Wow. Um, after it, because I was just like... Uh, you know how I've, I've I've got to that point of being able to take a penalty and I mean I'll never forget the moment because I helped get the club there in the first place in, yeah. the, in, the, in the semi-final you the semi. yeah, yeah, the yeah. semi-final against Burnley was probably my best game for Tottenham I come on at half time we were losing 1-0 in the first leg I come on at half time s scored one set up two we won the game 3-1 that's what got us to the final Yeah, I ended up getting injured in the second leg and that really put me in doubt of whether I'd be able to be involved uh, in the final. But Harry Redknapp said to me after that game, he said, get yourself fit. Even if you're 80%, I'll put you on the bench mm. and I'll give you some minutes because if it wasn't for you, you wouldn't be here. Okay. And he did. Yeah. You know, I wasn't 100% fit. Right. But it come to the, that game, we played Manchester United. It was a tight affair. And he put me on. And he gave me that opportunity to get on the pitch and I'll never, met, I'll never forget it. He had an amazing reception from the fans because mm. they understood the situation. And I got on and obviously went to penalties. And I remember going up to Harry Redknapp. He got us in the huddle. He wants to take a penalty. I put my hand up straight away. Mm. I was like, I'll, I'll, Gaffer, I'll take one. No problem. Okay. And he was like, okay. I said, I'll take the first one. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I was like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, my legs just went like lead. Yeah. Like, that walk to take oh. that penalty. Like, because you, you, obviously you're having to wait for the moment for the yeah. ref to come and, you know, take take the spot 
And then you you you're obviously then all of a sudden your eyes open up to rea the realization of actually what you're about to do. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, you know, Tottenham hadn't won, you know, for Man United it was every year. Yeah, yeah. You know, but you're coming up against a juggernaut, you know, and I'm now going to step up to take a, pe a penalty, which was the biggest moment of my career. And yeah, I felt like I was on a fucking travelator walking up to take that pen. You know, I, I was ne I was nervous. Yeah. I was nervous. And I picked my spot. And you know, Ben Foster made a really good save. I didn't blaze it over the bar. It was a, you know, it was a it was a half decent if the keeper goes the other way, you'd say it's a great penalty. But yeah. he goes that way, makes a save, and oh my god, my heart sunk. Yeah. Honestly, I just wanted to sink into the floor at Wembley. I'd never felt so distraught in my whole life. It was a horrible, horrible feeling. And David Bentley then missed as well. Man United scored all, all of theirs and, and they won. And I never, it was the most painful feeling as a footballer I've ever felt. It was yeah. just absolute agony. Like I'd love like any moment you'd want to take back in life, you'd want that moment again. Mm. Fucking Ben Foster. <laughs> Have you spoken to him about it after since? Um, no, but I, I've, I've seen him on Talk Sport a few times and he, he's had a bit of a laugh and he's like, yeah, it was easy save. I've, I've seen him dig me out. But it was at the time where all of a sudden they started having the iPads of previous penalties. Yeah. And I took a few for England. I took a few on loan. So he had five penalties of mine. And I think 80% of my penalties, I'd always wrap it with my left foot. Right. You know, because that felt like the right technique to wrap across it. That was going to give me the power to go into that corner. He he already knew. Yeah. He he knew where I was going. He uh, he knew, and he said to me, "I knew where he was going." I was like, "Yeah, cheers, thanks, mate. <laughs> Brilliant. Just missed a penalty at Wembley because yeah. of you." Um, so yeah, after that, I couldn't take a penalty after that. Really? Like, it fucking affected me. I don't even like taking penalties in a charity game now. <laughs> Little sex aside. Yeah, right? like, nah. no, I'm like, now nah, go on, someone else take it because that <laughs> feeling of missing a penalty has haunted me. Yeah. It, the, the pain I feel every time I go and take a penalty now when I've stepped up in charity games or whatever, I go instantly go back to that moment yeah. of you missed that penalty at Wembley. And that's something you can never get away from. Wow. At least you were there in the first place to be able to do it. Yeah, know, and you know amazing. what? I look back and I go, the, the fans reception, I'll never forget it, the fans reception the week after, because I cried my eyes out. It, it really hurt me. And yeah. I never forget the fans' reception afterwards. That they they really got behind me, like they really you know I had a stand innovation at the next home game. They really got behind me, and they knew that I was distraught. And you know, obviously they they supported me through that that time. And I had the bollocks to stand up there. You know, like yeah, that, yeah, you yeah. know, like there was probably better penalty takers in the team at the time who we were on the pitch who didn't put their hand yeah, up. Yeah, you know, so at least I had the the balls to be like, I'll I'll do, I can it. do it. You know, I was only well, I think it was 21, 22. Mm. And I was a young lad, so to have the balls to stand up there yeah. and take one shows the character. And you know, I wish I was wish I was more of a pussy <laughs> <laughs> and said no. So um, obviously, so how long are you at Spurs after your debut? Then how long? Would it um, been total? I think I maybe had three, two or three seasons at Spurs. And then I kind of fell out with Harry Redknapp a little bit and mm. I ended up going on loan to Portsmouth. Yeah. Um, which was amazing because basically I was in and around the, the, the team at, at Tottenham with Harry. Um, I had a really good pre-season. Well, well, just quickly, on, you said you fell out with him. Why? Um, he didn't play me. Right. Right, which is... You know, Always going to yeah, be like, a, you know, an it, issue. Yeah, it, it wasn't like a massive... And yeah, yeah. I f uh, he yeah he, he didn't play me he was playing Tom Huddleston we'd signed Luka Modric I mean yeah <laughs> you know I knew my time Future was Ballon d'Or winner yeah I was like <laughs> you know I thought my time might be limited here with, yeah. with him coming in yeah. but I was fighting for my place with him him Gareth Bow, Genus Huddleston you know we had a really good team yeah. and I was always in that kind of realm of left side left midfield I could play left back or left side of a centre you know mid and so I was fighting for that little area and I, I was, I'd play one in three, one in four. I wanted to play every week. Mm. So, you know, I knocked on, on Harry's door and I just said, look, I, ain't, I can't sit on the fucking bench anymore. Like, I want to go and play. I need to play. I want to get some, I need to get some appearances. I, I want to play Premier League football. I'm good enough. So you pushed the move. So I pushed the move. Yeah. Um, and he didn't want me to go. He right. wasn't like, yeah, see you later. He didn't want me to go. Um, but he allowed me to go. So mm. I went, I had a three month loan deal to start with uh, Portsmouth, who were in the Premier League at the time. Yeah. Um, made that move happen. And literally the week I signed, fucking Luka Modric broke his leg. He fractured his fibula. And, wow. ha and Harry Redknapp was getting asked, 
how have you let Jamie O'Hara leave yeah. with no recall clause? So I'm now sat at Portsmouth because of, because of my stubbornness to not wait and that, not have any patience. I never had any patience in life. Luka Modric gets injured for three months. So I could have been starting. Yeah. I could have been playing. I had to just take it on a chin. The emergence of Gareth Bale happened after that, right? Gareth Bale, he played Benoit Asu Okoto at left back. And because I wasn't there, he pushed Gareth Bale up to left midfield. Mm. The rest is history. Yeah, yeah. Right? Do you know what I mean? And then when Luca came back, he played Luca Modric centre mid because Luca was playing on the left. Right. And he was playing Genus and Huddleston. So what happened right. was Gareth Bale come, the emergence of Gareth Bale happened, Luca Modric come in centre mid, and all of a sudden Tottenham were unbelievable. Yeah, so yeah. So I was like, I'm never getting in this fucking team. <laughs> I might as well start Portsmouth. Um, so I ended up staying at Portsmouth. I loved it. Yeah. I, I, I loved it down there. Brilliant. Fans were amazing. I was playing week in, week out. You know, I was the star man. Mm. You know, I was, I was the one being talked about all the time. And it was just like, yeah, it was it was a really, really good time. And we ended up getting to an FA Cup final that season. And it was, you know, incredible. Yeah. And then the time comes to fully move on from yeah. Tottenham. Yeah. That must have been hard. Yeah. So I, I, had, a, I, had, I had a decision to make because I, I got injured after at the Portsmouth, after the FA Cup final. I actually played in the FA Cup final with a fractured spine. Wow. So I had two. So I've got two titanium screws and a rod in my spine right um i had to have surgery I, I took bone marrow out my hip packed it in my back i opened back surgery um, does that give you any trouble now yeah so, yeah? yeah yeah yeah. a lot or changed my career yeah, yeah okay. I, I, it completely changed the 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 way i played yeah. the way i run the injuries that i sustained after that right. kind of all to, to do with my back yeah um so i had that surgery after portsmouth i was out for like nine months Come back, I went on loan to Wolves. Done really well. Scored a goal on the last day of the season to help keep us up in the Premier League. And then they come in and said, Mick McCarthy phoned me and was like, look, we've made an offer to Tottenham. They've accepted the bid. Do you want to sign? And I was like, how much pay me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a fair enough question. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I was like, look, I, you know, I was on decent money at Spurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they didn't mess, and to be fair to Wolves, they didn't mess about. Yeah. They offered me a five-year contract 45 grand a week. Um, it was, you know, life changing money. You know? It's almost that's a 10 million pound contract. If yeah, my mental, yeah, yeah. Like, I, 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 it was, I think it worked out because the appearance fees obviously weren't guaranteed. You had to right, play, okay. but the, the guaranteed sum over five years was 8.8 .8 million. Right, yeah. Okay. And I never forget it. Sat in a belfry. I met my agent there. He'd obviously gone and had the meeting with Wolves. I sat in a belfry and he said, he just wrote down on a, a napkin. <laughs> Never like like in a film or a TV yeah, show. A napkin. He went, it's 8.8 .8 million. He handed it to me and went, do you want to earn that for the next five years? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, go on in. <laughs> Over. <laughs> Over. <laughs> Thinking I'm set. Yeah. So I was like, that's it. I'm set for life. Yeah. Right. So that was it. I, I moved away from Tottenham, moved on from them. Um, I was gutted because I was, I love Tottenham. Right. Mm. But I felt like the time was right for me to move on. Um, in hindsight, maybe I look, but I still had three years left at Tottenham. You know, I should have, maybe I could have gone back and fought for my place, you know. And Do you think you should have? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because after that, was it was an absolute fucking disaster. My career just spiralled out of control. Yeah. Um, so I never, ever, the biggest mistake I made was leaving Tottenham. Right. I should okay. never have left. Because leaving Tottenham to go to Wolves, I thought in, that was a good decision. But actually, it was a terrible decision. Mm. It was a really bad decision. Um, I moved away from my support network, my yeah. family, my home life, something that I've always had. Yeah. And it was the first time I properly moved away from it. And I moved to Birmingham with my partner at the time. And it was a fucking disaster. Mm. Disaster. And yeah, I'm so, I'm, I just, I look back and think, why did I leave? I should have stayed. Do you think that would have still been... Obviously, Wolves didn't do so well after no. you signed for them. No. I'm not saying that's your fault, but, you know... No, it was but, part of my fault. But of course it was. Think, Do you think that would have been different had you signed for a club that was more stable, was doing better, yeah. was on the up? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. You know, like at the end of the day, I realised, looking back, was I went to Wolves with Mick McCarthy on loan, and it was good, but I was on loan. Mm. So it kind of was no pressure on me to, you know, stay there. When I signed for them, that was like, right, that's it. You've left Tottenham. So you're now away from the big club. You know, you when you're a young player... And I was still young. I think I was maybe 23, 24. So I was still young. And you feel it was downhill from there, career-wise, or not as good as it 
downhill was, I fell off a cliff at that young age as well I fell off a cliff wow. I, honestly my my I didn't know where I it was wow yeah. I mean I got injured so I signed for Wolves in the first 16 games we were playing and I done okay I was playing all right Wolves promised me I was the marquee signing for Wolves, mm. right? Because I was, you know, coming from Tottenham it was a big deal. Yeah, Sp- yeah I yeah. sat down with Mick in the summer and he said, we're going to sign this, 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 him, him, and him, and him. We're going to have six, seven players and we're going to kick on. Yeah. Right, that's what we're going to do. We signed one player, we signed Roger Johnson. Right. So it was me and Roger Johnson that come in. And, you know, Roger was a good player, he was all right, but I was, you know, we needed five or six yeah. signings to be able to compete that season you know they just stayed up I scored in the last day of the season to help keep us up Yeah, we stayed up on goal difference so you really need to kick on so you, if you want to stay in the Premier League you had to strengthen yeah. right and we didn't and it ended up just being an absolute shit show I got injured because of my back I ended up getting groin tendonitis so I played 16 games at the start of the season got injured didn't play again and I was having injections in my groin I was doing everything I could just to try and get out on a football pitch. And I started playing, I was playing shit. Yeah. You know, every time I played, people didn't, obviously people didn't know what was going on behind yeah. the scenes, but I would, I was, you know, 10 minutes before I walk out, I'm in the doctor's room with a steroid getting injected into my groin just to numb the pain for 90 minutes. And then I'd walk off the pitch after 90 minutes, I can't walk for five days. How often do you think that's the case? When we see a player who's been playing really well, all of a sudden has a drop in four. Every week. Is it... But is, is that is that so often going to be an injury that's causing that? And well, we just I mean, don't know about it? I mean, there's so many... Of course, there's so many different things. Yeah, injuries. Yeah. You know, that, that you, you you know you see it now. It, the, every player's playing on an injury. Yeah. No one's ever 100%. Yeah. Like, no one. Um, it's just how, how low they're going and what... The, I think now players, you know, at that, that time... The player power with the physios and the manager was, mm. give me the fucking injection, I'm playing. Yeah, okay. Now... They say no. They're like, no. There's a lot more welfare in terms of, you know, looking after players and, and what's acceptable and what isn't. But it was like the Wild West. I was getting an injection every game to train yeah. and... It was, come on. I, was like, I mean, what? I was just numbing yeah. a massive problem. Your body is telling you... And then you make it worse because you can't feel the damage you're doing then. I was making it worse every single game to the point where I was out for nine months. I had three surgeries. I had two double hernia surgeries. I had a groin surgery. That Both of them didn't work. So I come back, done three months physio to get back. Walked out on the football pitch, kicked the ball, still in pain. Another surgery, back three months, the same again. It was mm. terrible. Um, and by that point, Wolves got relegated out of the Premier League. Yeah. I'm still injured. So I'm like, right, so now I'm playing in the Championship. Um, and I'm sat there like, I'm injured and I'm in the Championship. This is not where I wanted to be. Yeah. I was having a bit of a nightmare off the field in terms of my, you know, my marriage and that I wasn't happy and things are going on. And I was just spiraling out of control. I come back, tried to get fit. We got relegated again. <laughs> And I was like, yeah. and, and and the problem was, was I was getting the blame for all this because I was the marquee signing and I come back and I wasn't, I wasn't playing well. I wasn't mm. fit. Yeah. I wasn't fit. I was nowhere near fit enough to be playing week in, week out to the level where I needed to be. And, you know, it, it, it ended up just being an absolute disaster. We got, we got relegated again to League One. On the last day of the season, we played Brighton away. And we had to win by like three goals. We were two nil down after half hour. So it was just an absolute nightmare. And I didn't handle myself well in that situation. There was a few things I did where I looked back and made some big mistakes. And, you know, I'd look back and go, I shouldn't have said that. A couple of interviews I said, I shouldn't have said that. Um, and then, yeah, I never forget at Brighton, we played, the Wolves fans were cheering to me, 40 grand a week, you're having a laugh. And I'm mm. like, what they, they didn't understand what I was going through. Yeah. I was out yeah. on a football pitch. I knew I wasn't fit, but I wanted to be out there for the team. I was trying to be out there to, you know, showcase my talent for one and two, help the help the team try and stay in the championship because it was a disaster. Yeah. There was 22 other players out there who yeah. weren't performing, but I got singled out. And I remember them singing that to me and I just was like, yeah, oh yeah well done. <laughs> Fucking hell. That went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> a lead balloon. Because what they didn't realise was, was I had a I had a, a 30% wage cut from the Premier League. So I wasn't on 40 grand a week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on 20. I but was they've, on 20, but they've but seen they, the headline. They from, see it, 40 grand a week. Yeah. That's it, you're on 40 grand a week. So I'd say, yeah, yeah, of course you know what I'm on. That's what, yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. 
they saw it as I'm sticking two fingers up to them. Do you know what I mean? And that that was far. Oh, that was terrible. Mm. Death threats. Like they wanted to kill me. Really? Yeah, they wanted to kill me. I wasn't even. I couldn't even go to. The was ground. that was that scary? I mean, death um, do you, do you, is it one of those where you can just go? Oh, that's not serious. It's just all bluster. Or is it like? Oh wow. Yeah, it was Especially pretty, when you got a family as well. It was pretty serious. I turned up and they were attacking me outside the stadium. I had my son in my hand. Do you know what I mean? So it was pretty serious. Yeah. yeah. And it was, it got to the point where I was like, wow, I mean, I need to just get out of here. Um, they got relegated to obviously League One and they made a decision to not involve me the next season at all. I didn't even have a squad number. So there was like six or seven players. They had to get off the wage bill. Um, Were you happy with that? Were you like, I'm done with this? Um, I no, of course not. I, just wanted, okay. I wanted to, I, I, you know, Kenny Jacket actually become the manager. Right. Okay. So I'd worked with Kenny Jacket at Mirwall. He knew I was a good player. I come so you're in, thinking, okay, now this I'm might thinking, work out now. Right, I'll go in first day of yeah. you know news with League One, deal with it. I kept my mouth shut all summer. I got myself fit, so I was actually fit. I come back first day, walked into the uh, you know, and Kenny Jacket says I need to speak to you. I was like, all right, Kenny, how are you? Good to see you again. Yeah, yeah. He said uh, you're not going to be involved this season. Mm. I was like, what do you mean? He went, no squad number. You're not allowed in the dressing room, and from tomorrow you've got to turn up at two o'clock in the afternoon to train. You're not allowed to be seen around Wolves, and I was like. Fucking hell. I was right. like, all right. So it wasn't like they, they didn't like end your contract. It was, I guess, no, they well, I, I had three years left. So, it, right. So they couldn't do that. So they just no. froze you out, basically. Just froze me out. Yeah. So they wanted me gone. Yeah. But the problem that they had and what they didn't realize was I was on a lot of money. Yeah. And obviously, the players that have been involved, you know, we got relegated twice. Who's going to sign these players? Yeah. yeah. On these contracts, you know, like I had, yeah. to, I had to prove myself again. Yeah. So I tried to sort out some loan deals and there was opportunities to, to go on loan to certain clubs. But I was like, no, I'm better than that. I'm not going to like a League One team again. Mm. Like I've done that. I know where I'm at in terms of my ability. I've been injured. I, I put my stubborn head on and said, no, I ain't fucking going. You've gave me this contract. You have to... They wanted me to just walk away. Yeah. Like for nothing. They were like, we'll let you go for nothing. I was <laughs> like... Hang on. Oh, well, yeah, well, no, yeah. that doesn't work like that. Yeah. You gave me a five-year contract. You know, it hasn't worked out for either of us. Mm. And I'm sorry. You know, I, I really wanted it to work yeah. out. I moved my whole family up here. I'm going through shit as well. It hasn't worked out. What do you want me to do? I'm not going to just walk away from fucking 25 grand a week yeah. just because you don't want me anymore. I'm going to have to sit here and you're going to have to sort it out. I've done a whole season. Of that? Of that. One wow. whole season, yeah. I didn't go on loan. I've done a whole season of not playing football. Training at two o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. And were you fit like, then? Could you have been I playing? I was fit. Right. I w he brought me back in for one game. So they was doing okay walls, but they had a few injuries. Yeah. And he brought me back in. Like there was, like, all the fans were like, we've got to get Jamie back. You've got a player there who's a Premier League football player, a championship yeah. football player. You need to use him. Yeah. He brought me back in for one game <laughs> and he put me on against, oh God, I don't even know who was playing. Fuck knows who we were playing. There was some <laughs> team in League One. <laughs> And I didn't do anything wrong, but I didn't do anything right. Like yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I, I wasn't like I, it was. He was just. He couldn't wait to dig me out. Right. It was like he unless me you back. came on, scored a hat trick, yeah, danced it, around everyone. Yeah. It was yeah. like he was expecting me to come on and be Maradona. Yeah. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? I was like, mate, you've, you've used me one game for twenty minutes, and he slaughtered me after the game in the dressing room. You fucking not good enough. I was like, you've brought me back in for one week. Yeah, yeah. Like, give me a chance. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? I've not played for a year. Like, I hadn't, I hadn't been involved. And after that, I was like, no, nah, fuck you. Right. Yeah, yeah, you fuck off. You're a prick. And, you know, he could never look you in the eye, Kenny Jacket. He never looked you in the eye. So even when he's having a go at you, he's like looking off. Yeah, looking, he don't fucking look at you. And I was right. like, no, nah, fuck off. After that, I was like, you can, you know, you can do one. You ain't fucking had my back. So mm. I ain't having your back. And that was it then. I was like, nah, go, I'll go back to training at two o'clock in the afternoon. No problem. And then, uh, and then I did. I did. It got to the point where eventually they were like, we've got to sort this situation out. Yeah. Um, and they ended up paying me off. So I actually, people don't know this. I had two years left on my contract, which was worth two million pound, well, one point eight million pound. My, my contract was that was left. Yeah, I sacrificed the whole last year of my money wow. to leave to be able to get out to get out. Yeah. So I said, you pay me up front this year's money. I'll sacrifice the year after. So I so I gave up a million quid basically to get out of walls. But they paid mm. me my, that contract up front. Because I thought, if, if I leave, I've got an opportunity to go and play somewhere. Yeah. Anywhere. 
I've got a million pound safety net of what they've paid me. Right. Or it was close, I mean, a million pound gross, right? So I still had to tax the money. Yeah. I had a million pound on my contract paid up. A million pound I sacrificed. Everyone walked away happy. When walls were, you know, doing well again. Right. Everyone had moved on. And I and I was like, I don't care where I go. I just want to play football. I would have gone and played for fucking Sutton Dynamos. <laughs> you know, I just needed to play football. I didn't yeah, care yeah, where yeah. it was, but I need. But yeah. I wasn't going to walk away from money for my yeah, family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had bills to pay. Yeah. I was going through divorce at that time as well. Like it was difficult. Yeah. Um. So I ended up walking away, and I went and trained on my own for a few months. Um. And actually, Harry Redknapp uh, phoned me and said he was at QPR at the time mm. in the Premier League, and he said, "Do you want to? Do you want to?" I said, "Harry, I need some help." I said, "I'm struggling. Right. I'm I'm in the shit. Yeah, I'm I'm fucking down. I'm depressed. I'm going through the vaults. I haven't got a club. My money's running out. I know you're at QPR. Can I come and train?" Mm. I said, "You ain't got. I don't want no money. I don't don't need to offer it. Just just can't let just put me in an environment." where I feel safe, mm. you know, where people know me, you know me, the coaches know me, let me just come and train. He said, Jane, get in the fucking car, I'll see you tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. So next day I went down to QPR and I trained with him for three months, every single day, and he treated me like a first team player. I was there with Bobby Zamora, Sean Wright Phillips, you know, Carl Henry, some really good lads, proper lads. And they would, do, and you know, we had a good side there. We had a really good team of people. And I trained every day with QPR like I was part of the team. And I was like the fucking best player. He used to come up to me after training and being like, fuck, Jamie, you're unbelievable. What, <laughs> like, he wanted to sign me. Yeah. Like, he actually wanted to sign me. But he his rota was full with the 25 players that he could right, sign. Okay. So he couldn't he couldn't physically sign me because yeah, yeah. he, he, he didn't have any space. Um, he said, train with me until you get something sorted. Right. Lee Clark phoned him from Blackpool. He took over at Blackpool. Blackpool in the shit, but I was in the championship. He phoned Harry Redknapp and he said, uh, I've heard Jamie's been training with you. You know, is he fit? He said, get him in the car. Mm. Get him up to Blackpool. Sign him tomorrow. He was like, really? He said, don't even, you, don't, you don't need a trial. Just sign him. I said, I promise you, it'll be the best decision you made. And Harry Redknapp doesn't actually realise, and I've told him this in the past, and, you know, he's gave me a hug over it. I actually think he saved me life. Wow, really? Yeah. Because I was, you were really lost and I was in a lost, bad place. Mate. I was lost. I was in a bad way mentally, because I just it, like someone took my legs away from me. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, all I wanted to do was play football, and I, I had no, I didn't have a house. I wasn't allowed back to my house. I was going through divorce. Yeah, I had nowhere to live. I was going back to my dad's. I was staying in hotels. I was just f didn't know where I was going from day to day. Turning up at QPR training, and then didn't know where I was going afterwards. Yeah, and him helping me through that period and just giving me the chance to go and be in a decent environment, I actually believe saved my life because I was actually getting to points where there were times when I was leaving walls and I was with no club and they paid me up and I was driving around in the car down the motorway thinking I could drive off a bridge here and not even care. Wow. So I was in a really bad place and he really helped me through that period actually, Harry, without even realising. that uh, He, yeah, he, he got me back to a point where I started giving. I started enjoying football again, and I imagine that not everyone would have done that in his situation because he didn't really get any benefit out of it, no, did he? No, no, no benefit at all. Yeah. There was no benefit for him in any way. He just done it. Couldn't sign you, and couldn't sign me. Just, just wanted to. Help he just you wanted out. to help me. He just he knew me. Yeah. He knew I was a good lad. Yeah, and he saw a perception of me which was in the media, which he didn't believe was right and wasn't me, and he knew I was a good kid because mm. and he. Yeah, he, he, he got no benefit out of that whatsoever. But he treated me like I was one of his star players. And that for me was, you know, life changing because it, it, it helped me get to a point where I got back on the football pitch for Blackpool. And I signed for Blackpool and I got player of the season. So looking back at your, your playing career, um, given what you've said, it's probably fair to say you don't feel like you reached your potential. No. Is that mainly injuries? Could it have been different? I think injuries were, were a massive factor. I yeah. think obviously the, the the broken back was was a was a was a you know changed the way I played. I couldn't run as fast or as quick. I wasn't as yeah. sharp or mobile as I was before that injury. Um, there was obviously that factor, but then there was other factors as well in terms of lifestyle changes, the way I acted off a football pitch, and mm. the, the lifestyle that I was living, um, and decisions that I was making maybe were. Um, you know, not not tunnel vision 
decisions, you know. Right. I was opening myself up to criticism, with, you know, all the time with uh, you know, doing fucking magazine shoots and, do you know what I mean? Mm. Okay, magazine, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> what am I doing, you know? Like thinking that I was David Beckham, right? I'm not David Beckham. Okay. You know, I'm not playing for Man United. <laughs> I'm not going out with Victoria Beckham, right? You know what I mean? So I made some, some bad calls. But when you're in it at the time, you, you don't you don't see. It's only when yeah. you you look back or you, you you look from the outside in, realize what a dickhead you look like. <laughs> so you're, you look, you're like, what are you doing? But I don't think anyone could look back at their journey, no matter how successful they've been, and not think if I'd have changed that, yeah, change that, it would make a big difference. Yeah, and you know, I, people talk about like my potential. You know, really, I should have played for England. Like with the potential that I had in terms of age groups that I played and. Yeah how good I was and, and you know, the, the, the stature that I had as a young player in, in the country was, you know, one of the best, the top five, you know, yeah. in the country. So in terms of potential, yeah, I didn't reach it, but I also reached a point where I still had a really good career. Yeah. You know, I played for Tottenham, I played for Portsmouth, I played in an FA Cup final, semi-finals, Carabao Cup finals, you know what I mean? I represented under 21s, you know, I played a lot of games in the championship, you know, like, I still made a career out of something that, you know, was from nothing. Mm. So in terms of, yeah, I, I could have been better. I should have been better if I you know, didn't get as injured as much as I did. I had a lot of bad injuries. And then, you know, then, and yeah, and different decisions that you make, little decisions that could have took you in a different direction. But I think everything sets you up for where I am now. Mm. And, you know, I look back and people ask me, oh, yeah, uh, you know, could have done this, could have done that, right? I've had a journey and I've had an unbelievable life so far yeah. and it's put me in a position where I kind of always wanted to be, you know, I'm in a great position now. So, so I wanted to move on to that actually about, so talk sport in, in particular, how did that come about? Um, I, I just done big brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got, I got asked. Well, okay. Do, well, let's start with that then. Why, why did you do that then? Why did you do that? Um, just, that's the, uh, well, I order. needed the fucking money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I needed the money. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd gone through a divorce, which cost me a lot of, you know, cost me a few quid, like, yeah. you know, cost me over nearly two million pounds. Wow. So I was, I was, I was skinned. Yeah. I had nothing. You know, I was playing for a house basically, which is in Birmingham where my kids were living in. And I was never going to, you know, uh, my whole life was make sure my kids are mm. settled and whatever, yeah. you know, you move on and do different things, but my kids are everything to me. So. I was paying out for a property which was costing me a fortune and I wasn't living there. Yeah. And the money was just dwindling. And I hadn't at the time I didn't have an income. Yeah. I wasn't playing. So it was just getting out, it was just spiraling out of control. It really was. So that eight point eight million that I was earning was was down to the bare bones. You thought you were set for life and it, I thought I was set for life yeah. and I was spending money when like it went out of fashion. Like right. you know, okay. I was you know, I'd fucking buy whatever I wanted. I'd go on holidays, I'd spend, I'd look after my mates, take my family away. Yeah. You know, I was spending it like it was gonna last forever. And that was and that is the I terrible decisions. You know, because one, you get taxed 50%. Yeah. <laughs> so it ain't 8.8 .8 million, it's 4.4 yeah. .4 million. Yeah. And that 4.4 .4 million, you've got to spread out over 30 years. Because as a footballer, you know because you're- Because you're done. Yeah. You're done at 32. You're not yeah. earning any more money. So that 4.4 .4 million has got to last you forever. Yeah. Because you might not do anything after football. So what are you yeah. doing with that money? Are you investing it? Are you putting it into something that's going to make money? Is it going to make a profit? You know, and you and then event and then so when you retire, you've got something to lean on. Mm. I didn't do any of that. Mm. I was spending that money. I was buying fucking nice houses. I was buying nice cars, yeah. and I was going on flashy holidays. You know, so I was. I didn't have the guidance. I didn't have the someone telling me what are you doing. I was just spending it how I wanted it. And yeah. I, at the time, the partner was I was with was quite happy to spend it with me, and we had a great life. Yeah, and done some amazing things. Yeah, you know, had some nice yachts and holiday, and you know, <laughs> some some decent holidays in our beaver with me pals. Don't get me wrong. You know, I've got memories that you think if I did it again, yeah. I'd do it again. But I I didn't have any money. I I got to you know thirty two and I was skin. I didn't have a, I didn't have nothing, and you know I was scratching around trying to get jobs here and there, trying to find something. And I got in, off. in what was it coaching or I was trying to find a football team. Oh, you still trying? Yeah, to play? so I was still trying to find a football team, yeah, right, yeah. And, and then this big brother, like big brother, like I was on I was on the cusp of going what direction? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. either going to carry on playing football, yeah, or you can go and do something different, yeah. right? And, you know, I never imagined doing Big Brother, you know, like that wasn't what I set out to do when I would finish football. Yeah. 
but the opportunity come up and they offered me 150 grand. I needed 150. I, I needed it. When you, yeah. You know, I was, you know. And it's not for that. I mean, how, for, how for long three weeks. For? Like three weeks. Eight, right. Yeah. So, so I wasn't playing. And then, so I had the opportunity. So in December, they offered me 150 grand to go and do the show on the 2nd of January. So I'd done all the filming for it, went through the whole process, and they were really excited to have me on. First, I think it was around the 28th of December, I got a phone call from Burton Albion. <laughs> okay. So, um, if they phoned me up and was like, we need a left-sided midfielder, we, you're free. Yeah. Will you come and train? <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, fuck, here we go. <laughs> so I've gone up to Burton Albion for two days, trained, ripped it up, flying, trained really Did you well. tell them, or oh, by the way? They didn't know. Right. They had an inkling because it had been in the press that I might have been going into Big Brother. So um, the manager obviously comes up to me and um, he, he says, uh, I want you. I said, I need you. We're in the championship. Uh, I'll play you week in, week out. I'll pay you two grand a week. So it was like mm. two grand a week till the end of the season, till till June. Prove yourself. We'll go from there. So I'm looking at thinking, I've got 150 grand guaranteed for three weeks. Yeah, yeah. But I can't tell him I'm going on Big Brother. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to get away with this. So I was like, look, Gaffer, I've I, I, I got to go away. Let me think about it. You know, you can't sign me till the 1st of Jan. Let me speak to my agent. I phoned my agent. My agent, my football agent, didn't know that I had another agent. Right, okay. So this was a media agent who got me this big brother thing. Yeah. I phoned him up and he said, right, let's get it done. Two grand a week, you're playing. 60, 70 grand to the end of the season. I said, yeah, um, about that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, I've, I've been up going on big brother. And he went, what the fuck are you going on about? <laughs> he was like, I've got you a Burton Albion championship football. Yeah, yeah. You turn it down. You go and play football. I was like, yeah, no, you're right. You're 100. You're right. I said, but it's 150 grand. I need it. I've got lawyer fees. Lawyer fees to pay. <laughs> so, I, yeah, no, you're right. I turned, I, I was like, I'm going to turn it down. So I phoned Channel 5, phoned the exec boss who, I said, look, I can't come. I said, I'm not doing it. I went, are you fucking winding us up? We, you're going in in two days. Like, you're in. It's yeah. done. The show's set. Your contract signed. You can't, I was like, no, I'm not going. You can't force me there. I'm not going. I'm going to sign for Burton Albion. And they went, how much are you paying? I went, two grand. And she went, 60 grand. I went, yeah, but I'll never play football again after that. Mm. I'll never play professional football because no one's going to take me seriously. So like, she was like, what can we, what, it's like, we really, really want you on it. Like, you've got to do this. We really want you. What can we do? And I went, you can pay me another 150 grand. <laughs> she put the phone down. Five minutes later, she phoned me back up. She went, we'll give you 300 grand to turn down Burton Albion. Wow. I went, yeah, go on then. <laughs> yeah, wow. So I turned down Burton Albion. And you, this wasn't a negotiation tactic. You were genuinely... No, I was genuinely... I, I was like, going to go... No, it wasn't a negotiation at all. Yeah. I was signing for Burton Albion. Like that that yeah. move was happening. I actually interviewed the manager. Is it uh, Brian Clough or Nigel Clough? One of them, the younger one. Nigel. Nigel. <laughs> Nigel Clough, not Brian Clough. Nigel Clough. He actually come on the show the other day and I hadn't spoke to him. Right. For years. And they brought... And obviously talk sport, talk sport. They brought it up. Yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, we laughed about it. He didn't talk. He didn't talk to my agent for years over it. And I was, he was gutted because I, 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 luckily, but now in that season they stayed up in the championship, so I was happy for them that they stayed up. Mm. But yeah, and then that changed everything. Yeah. After, so I went on Big Brother, and then and everything well, changed. I mean, going on that, were you? I would be terrified of oh, thinking, how are they going to edit this? What yeah. are people going to think of me afterwards? Are you yeah. thinking these things as well? But you think, well, I'm going for the money anyway, so I'm going to do it. I was like, you know, I, I, I had a bad perception anyway. Everyone right. thought I was a prick. You know, like, <laughs> okay. you know, like, you know, like, but I wasn't. But, but there were people out there, who, you yeah. know, I, I, I got done, obviously, you know, love scandals, yeah. right? In, in the papers and, yeah. and all that. And, the perception behind me being divorced, you know, like it was it, it, my, my people who didn't know, really know me properly mm. saw a perception of me, that, which I didn't believe was right. So I saw the opportunity to come big brother to change that perception. Right. So people could see the real me, the person I really am. Okay. You know, I was just going to go on there and be myself. And if people like me and they like me, if they don't, they don't, you know, you can't, you can't please everyone. But I knew the perception of me wasn't correct. Okay. You know, there was a lot of shit that was out there in the media about me. So perhaps in that sense, you didn't have that much to lose from a perception. No. If people are already not thinking good things about you, no. worst case scenario, they still don't. Yeah, <laughs> Best exactly. case scenario, you rehabilitate your image somewhat. And that's exactly. Beneficial. And that's exactly what I went in there for. Yeah. To, to kind of change people's perception of me, to just see the real me. And, you know, I wasn't going in there to be fake. A lot of people were doing them shows to just go on and, you know, be fake and whatever, just... 
be these fake people. Right. And I just went on there and was myself. Mm. And it went really well for me. It was amazing in terms of that perception was he's at, you know, he's just a nice kid who's had a tough run and yeah. you know, he's he's down and you know, he's fighting to to keep himself alive and yeah. he's a nice bloke and you know, I think it changed a lot of people's minds and it opened up different opportunities for me after that and that's where the whole kind of then after that the media career started to you know started to kind of go in a different direction and you know my agent was right I didn't play professional football after that yeah but I went to Billericay and, and played non-league football which was a bit of a story evolved around media and stuff and you know that was fun and I was playing football but I had my eye on the media stuff where I wanted to go with that. So you're you're doing the Big Brother thing, thinking you thinking that might be an option afterwards. No, I wasn't thinking anything to right. be honest. You just with thought, me. just next I step. was just like fuck it, you know. Yeah. Like I was, you know, let's experience something different. I've played football since I was seven years old, mm. you know, and you know what? I've fallen out of love with the game a little bit with the politics and where I was at and how my career dwindled away a little bit and the money I'd lost. And I was like, you know what? Let's just do something different and go for it. See what happens. What's the worst case? What's going to happen? You do a show for three weeks, forgotten in a week. No one cared. No one really cares. Yeah. Um, I was, and worst case was coming out 300 grand richer. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, I'd done it and it went really well and it just opened up and I was still lost. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I was still lost. I did not know where I was going and where I was going to, what I was going to do. But, I just was just let's go with the flow and see where it takes me. But I kind of always had a mentality of I'll figure it out eventually. I'll, okay. it, will, it will fall into place. Yeah. Uh, you know, and once something that I found a passion for, which was the media in, you know, and doing that kind of stuff, I, that was when it kind of just took off from there. Talksport gave me an opportunity to come and do a show um, with Adrian Durham at West Ham. Right. And yeah, and it, and it kind of just went from there. Yeah. I was drunk when I done the show. <laughs> really, that first one. Yeah. <laughs> so you weren't you weren't looking at it as a trial at the time. You weren't thinking this is a tester, and if it works out, I got a good gig here. It's yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. I was. I mean, I remember I laugh of it with with a now. It was at West Ham, and I'd done an all nighter out in London, and I've turned up at Upton. Uh, no, at the the new stadium, the West Ham Stadium, uh, the Olympic Stadium, and I was hung over. <laughs> I was hung over, but. I realised I could. I was good at talking. I could yeah. talk football. That. Yeah. I love football. I could talk football. That. Yeah. And it kind of just went from there and it just trickled along. Wasn't doing loads. Wasn't, you know, wasn't in instantly straight away. Mm. Um, but I then kind of found a path. I found a line, you know, like you know, I had like a path line from a young age to be a footballer and that was... Yeah. That was my path line. And then I'd fucking gone off and was all over the place, lost where that path was. And I kind of brought myself back to a path line where it's leveled me out. You know, I stopped going out partying. I concentrated on work and become reliable. Yeah. And saw that as a bit of a vision again. And that was like, right, okay, that's, let's start manifesting that. Let's start visualizing that future and see where that goes. Cause I like this and this is a passion of mine and I'm, I'm quite good. But chatting shit so do you think you're a better pundit or a better footballer oh a better footballer <laughs> oh, come on. I mean come on I mean, okay <laughs> yeah the amount of rubbish that I come out with on a weekly basis mate yeah but isn't that a part of being a pundit because yeah. it's not just to get things right is it it's to entertain it's to yeah of course I mean listen you've got to be controversial to a certain yeah. degree but I always just I always people say to me like Are you, do you say these things to, to get clickbait and I'm like no, I just say it, you know, whatever rolls off the just tongue, you know, like, and I think that's what people liked with me, especially with Talk Sport. Yeah. Um, because, you know, Talk Sport was very much the white van man, you know, proper football fan. Yeah. Wants to come on and have a rant and say it how it is, you know, <laughs> yeah. and they're hearing it now from, you know, I was going on Jim White show at the time. I was phoning up talking about Tottenham and I was coming on being an ex Tottenham player talking about our shit Tottenham were, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, yeah. and they was, and they loved it. They were like, we've got a player who's actually opening his, a current player who's yeah. still knocking about. It's not like an old player. This is a player who's been in the game, 
who's coming out and saying it how it is. Because normally they've got mates, they don't want to ruffle feathers. Of course, just yeah, not mates in football they? yeah. and they're still worrying about their image or, yeah. you know, what they're going to, you know, I'm not going to get another club and they don't mm. want to be seen saying this. But I have a politically correct answer. You know, the same old shit that you hear from footballers every yeah. week. We go again next week or, you know, yeah, let's, you know, we do it. We can be better. Blah, blah, blah. All just, you know, robotic nonsense. And, you know, I gave people honesty. I just was saying what I saw. And they loved it. You know, I wasn't saying anything that people weren't thinking. I was just saying it how I see it. And TalkSport were like, yeah, I love it. And they were like, right, let's start getting you in more. And that's when I just started going into the studio. And yeah, it was just that then was just kind of started to take off. And I settled back into a better life. And TalkSport gave me opportunities. And I thank them so much because they, they, you know, they really gave me. And I, the biggest thing I realised was to be reliable, mm. like just say yes. The money was shit, right. right? It wasn't like I was getting decent money. I was literally yeah. doing it for nothing. But it was the fact that it was like, say yes, say yes, say yes. Sky phone me up, TalkSport phone you up. Anyone phones you up to do anything, say yes. Say yes. You know, because it's going to get you in the door and, and that's going you know, to give you a pathway into doing that media stuff. And, and in the media side of things, people seeing you is going to help you get other stuff. Of course. So you just, there's people are seeing you. Compounds and then grows that way. Yeah, and I was like, right, you know, I I was visualising, like, that's it, I had my vision back. That yeah. was I had, a, I had my tunnel vision again. Right, this is what I'm doing. It started off at one day a week, then it went to two days a week. Then I was like, right, let's get three or four days a week yeah. of work, you know? How much more can we do? And before you know it, I'm working every day. And then it kind of just went from there. COVID happened. And in COVID, I said to TalkSport, I said, look, obviously everyone was trying to work from home and all that, but TalkSport didn't really want that. They wanted people in the, the studio because it, they needed people to, you know, on the radio and people doing it from all over and from the house. It just didn't sound right. Mm. And, I, I made, and I, said to, I said to them, I said, look, I'm available every single day. Right. You want me to come in to the studio every single day at any time, I'll come in and do a show, no problem. Mm. And that in COVID really was when, you know, people were off. And yeah, there was yeah. Furlough and whatever. And I was like, nah, I'll work every single day. And I was and I did. I basically I was mm. going into the studio, I was doing breakfast show, I was doing drive, you know, I was doing everything. And then that's when they really then were like, You're part of the company. So I've seen a lot of clips on YouTube with you having a, a heated debate with someone on TalkSport. <laughs> is there one that really sticks out in your memory? You think, oh, we had a really big argument about that. Um, I mean, I, I have arguments every week with Jason Cundy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll never, I, I mean, there's been a few moments where I'm like, oh, I dug out Tottenham a couple of seasons ago and it went down like a fucking lead balloon because... <laughs> I love Tottenham, right? Yeah. I love going down there and, you know, I like to be part of it and whatever. And I dug out the players and said, none of them should be wearing a shirt. The only one who's fit enough to wear the shirt is Harry Kane. Um, the rest of them are a fucking disgrace. You know, like I, I went in like for 10 <laughs> minutes. It was a proper rant. And uh, Daniel Levy reached out and was like... Did he? Yeah, and was like, they got one of the people to phone me and was like, nah, not having that. It's not good enough. You play for Tottenham. And I was like... <laughs> I, I, I really rattled her feathers. I went to interview Harry Kane and he refused to do an interview with right, me. Right, okay. Um, because I'd really pissed him off because I dug out the players personally. Yeah. You know, like saying, you are not good enough. You, you and you and you were good. I was only saying what people, That's everyone what was saying the same thing. The fans are saying that. Yeah, yeah. fans are saying yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I just said it. Yeah. And they saw it as this disrespectful because I was a player. And that probably was, you know, in my part, you know, yeah, I maybe shouldn't have named names. But it was my job. I mm. said to Tottenham, I said, I'm getting paid to have an opinion. Yeah. And this that's my opinion. Whether you like it or not is an opinion. You know, if I don't if I don't give you my an honest opinion, people are gonna see through me. Yeah. And I'll be out the door. And you ain't gonna pay me. Are you giving me an ambassador role? Yeah. Are you paying for me to come down to the training ground and be part of the top? No, I need to get paid. So my opinion is that's what I'm saying. And talk sport are paying me for that opinion, and I had to give it. And then they kind of and then, you know, I've always kind of just Try to be pretty honest. I've had, I mean, I have plenty of rows on now. I've had rows with Laura over Arsenal, and you know, I had, a, you know, always. But I, I, I see Talk Sport for me. You know, I've done Sky as well, which I love doing Sky. But yeah. Talk Sport was the radio, and they were like a team. They was like my Harry Redknapp Talk Sport. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like they got behind me. Good people there. Yeah. You know, family. They, it's a very family orientated place. People start. You know, work there from 
being, you know, like on the phones, picking up the phone to now being the bosses, mm. you know, like it's a proper family knit company. God. And they, they got behind me and they supported me and they pushed me on and they gave me, you know, media training and broadcasting training. And so I've always had a really close knit connection with all of the people there. I love working with them. And so now it's like, well, I'd love to have a laugh with Laura and Jason and all that, but we're trying, I'm trying to make it now where, um, cause I've gone into the presenting side of it, which fucking come out of nowhere. <laughs> I was like, how has this happened? Um, and now it's like, I've just tried to create a, where I, I, I love the family network of everyone. So now it's like, it was like a little talk sport network of us, Laura and Ali and Alan and yeah. Jason and, you know, Gabby. Now it's like, right, I want to bring everyone into the family and that the fans, and that's really good. And that's why the sports bar, I think it's been, you know, godsend for me because I get to speak to fans all the time. Hmm. What's your most controversial football opinion? Uh, God, it's a tough question. Something that you think that a lot of other people would disagree with. And you can't really see why. Perhaps. Could um, be something else. Controversial football opinion. Um, oh, I'm trying to think here. We can come back to that one if anything comes to mind as we go through. I mean, my, my dad always said that Wayne Rooney was overrated. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, I used to agree with him until I played against him. Uh, and then I was like, Dad, he's definitely not overrated. I promise you now, yeah. he ain't fucking yeah. overrated. He's unbelievable. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess controversial opinions, uh, you know, people still talk about Van Dyke. You know, I think he's overrated. Right. Um, Even this season, he seems to be back I mean, this season, I think he's been better, but I still think he's overrated. I still think, you know, I mean, when you talk about... I always look back at players that I played against, John Terry, mm -hmm. Rio Ferdinand, um, Vincent Company, mm -hmm. you know, Ledley King. I played with Ledley. I always look, and I look at Van Dyke and I think, yeah, he's good. Don't get me wrong. He's, he's you know, he's top class. I'm not saying he's shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, is he a legend... Well, he was playing for Celtic and he played for Southampton and then he had a couple of good seasons at Liverpool and he's done well, but is he, he's not John Terry. He's not Rio Ferdinand. You know, I, I don't think he's on that level and I think that, that, that annoys a few people when mm. we, we throw that one out. Imagine uh, Liverpool fans that aren't often at best at like, <laughs> yeah. hearing things that they don't I mean, like there's so hear. many. I mean, look, we like, we like to poke people, you know, like, <laughs> you know, we give it, you know, Newcastle's only a big club in Newcastle, you know, things, yeah, yeah. you know, but I mean, there's so many little things that you can, you know, have a dig at, what's the biggest derbies and things like that. But you know what, like, I just love to have the fun and have the banter, you know, like with Arsenal fans, you dig up. I and mean, I think people now know that, it's not, you know, it's not like a personal vendetta. We're having other football fans, yeah. you know, and, you know, I've got my team and I think the great thing about the media where I've gone and, and I think talk sport have gone that way a little bit is, is you don't need to be neutral. Yeah. You know, like you see pundits now on certain programs who have to give like a neutral answer. Right. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm a Spurs fan. Everyone knows I'm a Spurs fan. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Spurs and I'm going to big up Spurs and I'm going to say Arsenal are shit. Yeah. You know, like there's nothing wrong with that, but because that's what people do in the street or in the pub or at a game, you know, there's rivalry yeah. and that's what makes it fun. You know, if there's no rivalry, you know, Celtic and Rangers play against each other now. There's no fans. Like they're, mm. they're not, they don't have away support and they hate it. Mm. Football's about having rivalry. Mm. And I, and, and I, that's so, I love it that I can argue with an Arsenal fan, even if they're right. <laughs> I still argue with them, yeah. you know, because, you know, because I'm, I'm poking the bear like yeah. a little bit. And, you know, with Jason now, I work with Jason all the time and he's brilliant at winding people up. And he's, <laughs> like, he's the best at having a wind up with people. But it's fun in a nice way. Yeah. And we like to, you know, we've got the Chelsea rivalry and I had the rivalry with Laura and I think... You know, all this neutral rubbish. Oh, you've got to be neutral. Well, no, you haven't. I think the rise of fan channels, like on YouTube, have shown that. The people yeah. really very much are into that. They want yeah. to know. They want to hear people not watering down if their team's been crap. They yeah. want to have someone telling it how it is. And they want to... Exactly. Um, uh, they know, want see, to be like that. You see some of them. They're massive now. Like, yeah. huge. I don't even know who half of these people are. What do, you, I mean, what do you think about that? Obviously, a lot of these people haven't never played the game. They're giving opinions. I imagine at this point... 
swaying the opinions of fan bases. You know, that's good for the game, bad um, for it. No look, everyone's thing. entitled to an opinion. Yeah. You know, everyone's entitled to an opinion. Whether you're an expert or not, whether you've played, you're still entitled to an opinion. You go and watch your team play every week, then you're entitled to that opinion. You know, I, I get the umps sometimes when people start talking about tactical decisions or, or decisions right. that's made, you know, in a game that he's never been in that situation ever in his life. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in a school playground where he was the last one to get picked. Or on FIFA or something. Yeah, <laughs> or he played it on FIFA, yeah. And he's given a decision, or he's talking, you know, they're talking about, you know, a movement that someone's made or a decision someone's made in the heat at the moment. Yeah. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Like, you've, you've never been in that. You, ne you don't know what you're talking about. Like, you've yeah. never been in that moment. But I respect everyone's opinion. Like, mm. everyone's entitled to that opinion. And and I think a lot of them speak a lot of sense, you know, a lot of them. And I love that, you know, because it creates, you know, fan bases who follow these people, um, you know, they create, um, you know, auras around football clubs and yeah. brings a lot of attention, yeah. you know, to football clubs. And it builds up fan bases and, you know, then, you know, then I can go in and two foot of them. <laughs> <laughs> say what you want have, about have some fun with it yeah and there's some part and parcel it's fun right you know like we're all you know it's I always I always say to people like it's really not that big of a deal yeah do you know what I mean like it's not life or death here right you know we'll I, I, I love Tottenham but you know it, you know it's it's not life or death you know I, if Arsenal do well and they win the league of course I'm going to be gutted <laughs> and I'm going to go on and be like, I'm gutted but you know I'm not you know I'm not going to it's not going to ruin my year yeah you know, like we all just want to have a laugh. We're all football fans and we're all supporting, we're all passionate about our teams. But, you know, let's not take it too far. So my dad's a Man United fan. Um, he's watching a lot less football than he used to. What's, yeah. uh, what's gone wrong at Man United? I, 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 For me, when I look at Manchester United, I mean, look, I've never played for the club. So it's hard for me to, you know, have a real insight to what's happened inside the club. But what I see is, a, com and I see it with Chelsea as well. The, there's been a complete mentality change in terms of what's acceptable in terms of levels. Okay. Now I played against Man United when Man United were Man United. Yeah. You know, like you, I used to turn up to Old Trafford, and if you walked off that pitch and got beat two 0 that's a decent result. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like they would turn over everyone, and you'd walk in and you'd be in that tunnel, and you're stood next to Rio Ferdinand, Vidic, Rooney, Tevez, Skulls, Carrick, Ronaldo, Giggs. And they'd stand there like, we're going to destroy you today. Like, <laughs> yeah. You are getting destroyed. <laughs> Whoever you are, you're getting fucking destroyed. Right? And that was what the mentality was. Yeah. And you knew it. You could feel it <laughs> yeah. walking on the pitch. Like, uh, genuinely, you could feel it. I got that feeling with Man United. I got that feeling with Liverpool. And I got that feeling a little bit with um, Chelsea as well. Mm. Chelsea with John Terry, Lampard, yeah. Drogba, Balak. You stood there before the game thinking, fuck me, we're getting beat. Yeah. You're like You just knew it. And that was because there were levels set. There was standards set from leaders in, in the dressing room. And I look at Manchester United now and I think, there's no leaders in that team. Yeah. There's not one leader. The mentality's uh, gone. Young players these days, I think, is a completely different world to what it was when we were young. You know, the, the, the way they're protected, you know, they're, they're, they're covered up in cotton. You know, like, is it possible for them to be anything close to normal people at this point, given the very strange lives um, they have from young age? I mean, yeah, I mean, look, look it's it's changed, but it's you know, they're still normal people. A lot right. of footballers come from normal backgrounds, you know, yeah. and I don't think they, I don't think they're they're, they're they're different in terms of their personalities are different. I think their toughness in terms of what it takes to become a footballer. I think they are protected so much now by okay. football clubs mm. that. The mentality is different. I used to I used to scrub toilets right. and dressing rooms. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like they don't do that no more. I used to clean boots before I could go out and train. You know, like I just don't think that that just doesn't happen anymore. Like the, the the mentality they're soft. I think young players now are soft. Manchester United is full of soft players. Chelsea is full of soft players. These young players now come through. In my opinion, they've got no leadership qualities. Yeah, they've got no real. Um, bollocks yeah you know to, you know to, to be straight with it yeah they yeah. haven't got the bollocks to go out there and be winners and i look at manchester united now and i see that as a massive problem you know like rashford and sancho and 
You know, like the players that they're looking at to, to step up to a plate just ain't got the mentality. No they don't way. have the character of There's the no character. players that would have been there 20 years ago. No, do you think Rio Ferdinand pulls goals and, yeah. you know, like would would that, would, have, would accept getting beat by Brentford? 4-0. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> not just like, a little bit either. Not a chance. Yeah, There'd be yeah. rucks. There'd be fights in yeah. the dressing room. You'd be getting done by the scruff of the neck. Like, I remember coming in training once and I lost a training session and Robbie King got me by the scruff of the neck. You fucking train like that again, son. Wow. Right, you ain't gonna you'll be gone yeah you know like there was levels yeah. set and you know I speak to John Terry and, you, know, I, you know for me John Terry was the ultimate captain in terms yeah. of setting you know levels of you know what was what was good enough and you know I, I, I think he's on the same page as me where you, you go like they're just the, the levels are not there no more the, the, the accepted levels of where a football club should be mm. Manchester United should be the best club in the, in the country yeah, I don't care about you know. You can have you know. Manchester City got state money, right? Fuck off! <laughs> like you're Manchester United, you know. Man, Liverpool ain't got state money, but they they've got the, mm. they've still got the mentality. Liverpool still got the mentality because they got Jurgen Klopp. Mm. The mentality at that football club is still there. We are Liverpool. We beat everyone. If we lose one game in a season, that's not good enough. That's the levels that have, were set, and I think Manchester United have gone so far away from that. Because it was interesting about saying about young players being soft and you mentioned you felt like a rock star at, I think you said at 21 when you got mm. the, the bigger contract. It's like, imagine a lot of these players are feeling like that at 14. And that, I just think, I try and put myself in that scenario and think, yeah. what would I have been like if I, I'd have probably walked around like a mini tyrant, you know? Just I know, yeah, I'm, I, it, it's hard because the game's changed. Yeah. And, you know, I you know I took over at Billa Ricky and... I, and you know it's a completely different level to Premier League but mm. you're seeing young players who want to be footballers and yeah. that mate they are soft right they're so you can't even say anything to them anymore you say something to them they crawl up into a little ball like you know like okay. you know like I just don't think you can have that, say, that same um, argument like Harry hey, Redknapp used to come in and say you 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 and you fucking miles off it right I think if you say that to some players now, you, you've lost them. Yeah, okay. Oh, and go into a little ball and go into a little shell. I just don't know if that real toughness is there anymore. I think the game's changed so much where, you know, where they're so protected and they're getting money like from, yeah. you know, some of these players are playing in reserves on 30 grand a week. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You know how much, how much hard work I had to get to get 30 grand a week and the sacrifice I had to make to get that sort of money. These kids are play, getting 30 grand a week. They're not even in the first team. You know, like the, the, yeah. it's just inc it's just crazy, and it cha and it's changed. You know that hunger, that fire in your belly that I used to have, and I wasn't a you know I wasn't a world class footballer, but I had fucking hunger. I was you know I, I nothing was stopping me. I look at some of these players now and go, you have not got the fire in your belly. That yeah. fire is not in your that you're you're talented, right? Because there's always going to be talented yeah, footballers, yeah. right? And, there's, and and we're only going to ever get better. And super athletes, yeah. And you're only yeah, that you're and, and you know yeah. and it, look there's. The best ones will make it. The best ones will do it. Look at Jude Bellingham, right? Yeah. I fucking love him. Mm. I look at him and be like, he's unbelievable. Like the men. But if you watch him, if you look at him, he's got the fire in his belly. Mm. You can see it in his eyes when he walks on that uh, on that pitch. You watch him. He walks around like I'm the best player here, and I'm going to do it every single week. And you can see it. He's got that edge to him, like Rooney had. Like, and you can see it in Bellingham. Did you think he'd do it Real Madrid what he's done this season? Did you see that beforehand? I didn't I didn't see him being that good. Right. Yeah, I yeah. knew he was going to be a success. Yeah, okay. Like, it, I knew he was going to be a success because I watched him play for England. And look, you know, people from the outside, I look at the, I look at the character, I look at his character. And I, you know, one, he's unbelievable at football. And and he's got the physicality as well. You know, yeah. he's, he's, you know the physicality he's got is amazing for a young man. But if you watch his character... Mm. on a football pitch. I think we played against Scotland and we won 3-0. We absolutely pumped them, right? And Jude Bellum was just the best player on the pitch. But I watched him from the start and his character, when you walked on that football pitch, you could just see. He was walking on that football pitch to be like, I'm going to fucking run this show. Mm. You know, like, and that's not arrogant. Yeah, it's that's, just... That's confidence. Deep that, within him. Yeah, that's yeah. just in you. That's in you. And some people have got that and some people like, and I love that. And I actually, like, I looked at and I, that gives me goosebumps. I love watching Jude, yeah. Jude Bellingham. Not because of how good he is at football, because that's that's just a given. But his character is fucking amazing. And that's why he's going to be, I think Jude Bellingham is going to be our greatest ever football player mm. for England, ever. 
Ballon d'Or winner. He's going to win the Ballon d'Or. I, re- I think he'll win it three or four times. Do you think he'll win the next one? I think he's got a really good chance. Mm. You know, Haaland's injured at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's all going to go down to, you know, the Champions League, isn't it? You know, in terms Harry of... Harry Kane, another English one. Harry right. Kane's going to be, you know, he deserves to be in with a shot. Yeah. He's gone to Bayern Munich. He deserves... So whoever wins that Champions League, whether it's Bayern Munich, whether it's Real Madrid, whether it's Manchester City, I think it's between Kane, Haaland and Bellingham. Yeah. Uh, I think Bellingham is going to be close to... And obviously we've got the Euros as well, right? So are England going to win the Euros? How are we going to do? Um, I think we've got a really good chance. Yeah. I think if we keep Harry Kane fit and we keep Bellingham fit, We've got a great chance, an amazing opportunity to to do it. I don't know if Gareth Southgate has got the... I don't know if he's got the, the mentality. I don't know if he's got it to okay. take us to the, that final hurdle. He's got the players. He's got the players. Do you think he's overrated? Oh, it's harsh, isn't it, if I say yes. <laughs> it's fucking harsh if I say yes. Um, I wouldn't say he's overrated. Okay. I don't think he has got enough to take England to glory. Right. You know, I think he can get us to a point. I think he's he's, he's created a really nice club feel. Mm-hmm. I think he's, you know, he, he's, he's instilled a confidence in the players that they all want to play for England and they want to turn up and they love it. And, you know, he's got a really amazing bunch of players. I don't think he's, he's got the tactical nous to win a tournament. I think okay. he can get you to a point when we've always got to the last hurdle when England really and truthfully should always get to the last hurdle with, you know, fucking me managing. <laughs> you know, I could qualify for the Euros being the manager of England. Yeah, just yeah. go out there, they'll just picture Ben and Harry Kane, we're going to qualify. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you know, any man and his dog can manage England to a certain point. Um, when we've got to the final point, whether it's a semi final, quarter final, and we've played against the nation who are as good as us and have got the same quality, we get beat. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got beat when when we shouldn't have got beat. Italy, yeah. Croatia, France. You even that Italy team, how many players if you they did a combined than us. if you did a combined 11, how many Italian None players? None of them get in that team. Yeah. But in his but in his approach to them games, he goes back to his defensive quality, which because he was a center half, a yeah. boring center half, and he's pragmatic, you know, his 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 decisions that he makes are I always think he's very reactive in, instead of proactive. Like the game was in the balance against France. The game was in the balance against Italy. What are you going to do to, to get yeah. us over the line? Like, you know, are you going to make a decision before Italy make a decision or before something happens? You know, and he didn't. He didn't make them decisions. He waited and waited and waited. And the best managers like Pep, you know, like Mourinho, like the manager of one, you know, the, the everything, Ancelotti, they make a decision before it's happened. If you had the power to right now, would you change England manager ahead of the Euros? Could, could I put anyone in there? Uh, anyone who you think you could really Anyone's available? Again? Yeah. Or anyone? Or anyone. Like, not anyone. I, so not like you can't stick Pep in because I can't imagine he would do it. But um, um, anyone you think would be somewhat realistic to go in? I'd put Mourinho in there. Right, okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think if, if you're going to go into a tournament, I'd love mm. Jose Mourinho to be the England manager. Mm. I think it'd be amazing. Well, in this Euros, England must have the best squad, maybe alongside France, and it's probably quite a distance between them and yeah. the next Yeah, we don't have the best sort of. manager. Mm. And we don't have a manager who knows how to win a trophy. He's yeah. never won one. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I, if I was, you know, Eddie Howe, I think, is, is a potential England manager in the future. Yeah. You know, I think he's definitely one that you'd look at in the future and say, yeah, I think he could do a really good job. Um, I'd love Jose Mourinho. Okay. For, 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 It'd be fun if nothing else. Well, for two it? tournaments. <laughs> do you know what I mean? For two yeah, tournaments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With this crop of players. With, with this group of players, yeah. they all know how to play football. He's not gonna, we, we play defensive minded football anyway, but he mm. ain't going to change that. You know, he, but what he's going to give you is a fucking mentality to win a tournament. Yeah. And they're going to respect what he says. I think if you gave him the opportunity to take a World Cup or a Euros in the next four, four years, I think he'd win one. Mm. Okay. And how good would that be? <laughs> it would be, yeah, amazing. Yeah. it would probably get sent off in the final. Like, <laughs> That's fine. Be good to watch. It would, yeah. <laughs> Press conferences would be fun. Yeah. Um, who's going to win the league this season? I mean, I'd love to say Spurs, but <laughs> we fell off well, the Well, for a we? while, it looked like that might be on I the I know, and I kill myself, don't I? Every time Spurs <laughs> start well. We start well every season. I never learn. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's it. We're back. Spurs big, are back. We're going to win the league. Here. 
Um, you know, I, look, I, I genuinely thought Spurs, if we didn't get them injuries, we would have had a chance. Yeah. You know, I think if Spurs didn't get Van der Ven and Madison injured and Romero sent off for stupidity, I think we would have been top of the league. Because right. I don't think anyone's been amazing. No. Liverpool are there at the moment, they're top, but they're not like, no. yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, I watched them the other night. They're, like, they're not like incredible, but they've got a mentality. Mm. The mentality at Liverpool that Jurgen Klopp's instilled in them is at levels. And this is where we're at. And they had one season where they've been off it, you know. But they 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 have the level. They're not a group, they're not an amazing side. They got Harvey Elliott, Curtis Jones playing in the side. You know they're good footballers. They're not well class. They're not well beaters. McAllister, you know. But what they've got is a fucking mentality. I think they'll go close. Um, Tottenham will be amongst. The, I think man. I just don't think you can look past Manchester City. Yeah. Because they got what they got. They got Pep Guardiola, who is the best manager in the world. And he's got the mentality of always delivering when it matters. You know, he, he he's his levels are never ever anything short of a hundred percent. You got De Bruyne coming back. You got Haaland. I mean, that you know, he gets injured. You got Alvarez. You know, you got Phil Foden. You know, they're just they're blessed with with world class talent all over the football pitch. And I just think you know what the way they do business after January and now they kick on. I just think they're a steam train. A lot of people criticise Pep or downplay his achievements, should we say, by saying he's always had these big budgets. Do you think? Yeah, what's he going to go and do? Go and manage Bolton? <laughs> yeah, this is what annoys me with people when they say this. Like, what, what do you want him to do? Take over Wrexham? <laughs> yeah. Like, he's Pep Guardiola. He played for Barcelona. He got the Barcelona job, and he had Messi in his side and all these well beaters, and he took over a team because he deserved that opportunity because of his coaching. Of how good he was as a coach, what do you want him to do? Go and manage in fucking league? Uh, you know, <laughs> like he he got the opportunity to manage a top club and he took it. And you know, he you know, people say he downplay his achievements. Well, hold on a minute, there's been top managers who have been at top clubs and not achieved what he's achieved. Yeah, you know, like there's been other managers at Barcelona, there's been other managers at Manchester City, there's been other managers at Liverpool that haven't you know haven't done it, and Real Madrid, and they get sacked. Pep Guardiola don't get sacked. I think I think that is one of his achievements that's not often talked about that's probably one of the most remarkable. The three clubs that he's managed to not be sacked from any of them is yeah, mad. Yeah, because you don't get sacked because... He wins because, games. <laughs> yeah, but, well, because yeah, he, win, he wins yeah. and he instills a mentality in a football club that stays forever. You know, like he instilled mm. a mentality at Barcelona where that that's still like that's still there. Yeah. That's still that style of football. Manchester City, he's changed the Premier League in terms of how football's played. When Pep come over here, the way football played in, in England has changed forever. Mm. Yeah. And that's because of him. You know, like these inverted fullbacks and the way centre half going into midfield and all that. That didn't happen before, you know, like rarely, you know, it, you, but you know, now every team plays out from the back. Every team. You know, you used to have four or five teams in the Premier League that never played out from the back. Yeah. Burnley, Bolton, you know, like, you know, they have their managers and but now their managers are obsolete. You know, them managers, you know, you, you, unless you move with the times, you, you them, them managers don't get an opportunity no more because of the way the game's gone. Everyone plays out from the back. Everyone, you have to be comfortable in possession. Your goalkeeper has to be like an outfield player. And that's because of Pep Guardiola. Greatest manager of all time? Sir Alex Ferguson. Okay. By a mile. Will, is there a chance Pep will overtake him? Well, I, I, he'll, over, he'll, he'll overtake him in terms of his achievements, in terms of what he's won. Yeah, I think yeah. he probably will, but... I mean, how many Premier League titles did Sir Alex win? 14, 13, was it? I mean, how many did he win? I don't think Pep's ever going to get to that. Yeah. Um, but he's obviously done it in other countries, you yeah. know? Um, for me, Sir Alex Ferguson is the greatest manager of all time because of what he, where he took Manchester United and, and, where, he took, and where he put them. Um, you know, Manchester United, obviously a massive football club, but they wasn't, they wasn't winning things when he took over. And he took them to dominate you know, the yeah. Premier League in an era where, it, you know, no one could get near them. You know, they were just on another planet. And and the teams that he put together and the way he was as a manager, yeah, I would have loved to play for him. That was mm. that would have been one dream. Mm. I just would have loved to play for Sir Alex Ferguson. That's going back to that moment where you maybe could have gone to Man United. Gone to Man United, United. United. yeah, I know. Could've, yeah, of could've course. Could have been possible. Yeah, 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 of course. It could have been possible, yeah. absolutely. And you know, probably we've had the opportunity to to work under him. But yeah, I mean, I love him. His documentary and everything. I just love the way he is. I mean, for me, I played in that era where Sir, La Sir Alex was, you know, Sir Alex. And that was, his teams were just monsters. Mm. Monsters. You couldn't get near him. Best player you ever played with 
And best player you ever played against, maybe from one of those Man United teams? Yeah, um, tough question to answer because there's been, there's been a few. I mean, look, best player I would say I played with would have to be Luka Modric. I mean, you know, just to play with him, you know, you could see the talent he had as soon as you walked through the door. Um, and I, you know, I always laugh at Luka Modric from the Ballon d'Or and I'm, you know, doing a sports bar and talk sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was, you know, he was, pff, yeah, he was unbelievable. He couldn't yeah. have him. I think as a talented football player, he was, he was even at there. five foot two. Or well, he just couldn't get the ball from him. He had such a low center of gravity and yeah. he saw, for, he saw passes that no one else saw and, you know, the way he could move the ball, manipulate the ball, he was just, you know, he never, ever not had, you know, he was just so good. And once he grew in confidence at Tottenham and started realising himself that he was one of the best players and, yeah, there was nothing holding him back. So mm. I think I think Luca was was one that you would, would be a standout, was a standout player. Um, best player I played against, I mean, look, there's a few. Ronaldo, obviously, yeah. you know, I played against him a couple of times and he was just r- unbelievable. Um in terms of what he could do on a football pitch and how sharp he was. And, you know, he would, even if he wasn't having a good game, not having a quiet game, he'd still score. <laughs> you know, like he would always do something in a game, whether it's a free kick, whether it's an assist, he would always do something. Um, Paul Scholes and Steven Gerrard. Paul Scholes was my idol growing up. Like, I love Paul Scholes. Like, he was like, I used to just sit and watch videos of Paul Scholes and, you know, playing against him. He was probably one of the only players I was in awe of. Mm. Um, but in terms of getting the biggest run around, I'd say Steven Gerrard. Right. I mean, I played against him and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I cannot get near this guy. I'll never forget, we played, it was my, we Tottenham Liverpool at home. I started Gerrard in midfield. I was in midfield and I was like, I'm going to fucking do Gerrard. Like, I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him early doors who I am, what I'm about. First minute. Ball comes up, middle of the park, I go crash, go straight over the top of him. Yeah, fucking have that, Stevie. <laughs> Picks himself up off the floor and I never forget it. Just gave me a little look and was like, all right, fuck me. <laughs> For the next 45 minutes, I didn't touch the ball. Right. And he was like one, twos round me, fucking running past you when he's got 10 yards. Of sp- like he's 10 yards and he's past you within five. You know, like he's like, uh, he was, people don't realise how quick he was. Yeah. Like he was so quick. Like he could play as a winger, mm. but he would run through the middle of the pitch with the ball, without the ball. He was quicker than you, he was stronger than you, he was better than you. He was good on the ball and he had a, a character. He was horrible. Yeah, yeah. Like he was horrible. You know, he would go right through you and <laughs> wouldn't think anything about it. You know, like he was an animal. And then he'd go and, you know, score from fucking 40 yards. Like for me, I walked off. I mean, I got dragged in that game at half time. I couldn't wait to get off the pitch. He was, he was, yeah, he was. Pfft next level he went challenge accepted and uh, yeah, yeah 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 you didn't want to you didn't want to piss him off yeah you know you, you're trying to go through the game avoid like just let him have a quiet game if you pissed him off you get getting beat so changing tack slightly uh, about a month ago i um had a chat with matt letissier mm. who um did media work much like like you're doing now yeah he got sacked from sky for some controversial opinions so, yeah. so two parts to that do you think that was the right thing for Sky to do, number one. Number two, does that make you worried about being cancelled if you say the wrong thing? Yeah, I mean, look, I guess it's always a worry. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of, of Matt Letizia in terms of where he wanted to go and what Sky wanted to do. I think Sky maybe wanted to make changes anyway, regardless. Um, they use it as an opportunity, maybe. Um, look, I've got massive respect for Matt Letizia. I loved him as a pundit. Um, I, think you, I, I think in this day and age... The problem we've got is that if, if you're always very close to being cancelled, right? You're all, you know, you are yeah. one word away from being cancelled. And yeah. it is a worry because, and it might just be your opinion, but it might be an opinion that people don't agree with. And that's it. They jump on the bandwagon. You've had it. Mm. You know, you see it quite a bit. So you do, you know, you are very um, sceptical in terms of certain things that you can say. But I'm always on, on you know, I'm I'm an open book when it comes to, you know, women in football and you know like fair play to them if they're good enough and and they can talk and they're great at their job then I've got no issue with that you know because I always see it as you know I was a footballer and at the end of the day cream always rises to the top if you're good enough you're going to get an opportunity in, 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 in the media if you're good enough you'll get an opportunity and you've got to take that opportunity and you know I've worked with some amazing women pundits you know Laura Woods you know I've worked with Alex Scott which is brilliant you know Leanne Sanderson I work with and she, she takes a hell of a lot of stick 
And, you know, I think, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these women have represented their country. You know, Enya Lugo, she's represented her country. Mm. And, you know, she's entitled to talk about football. Yeah, the game's slower, women's football. You know, it's a different game. Of course it is. We still know how to control the ball. They know to talk about tactical decisions and, you know, awareness on a football pitch of where you might want to move the ball and manipulate the ball. They still know it might be slower. They still got to do the same thing. It's still the same game. They're not playing a completely different game. They're not talking about basketball. <laughs> You know, they're talking about football that they've played at the highest level of their in their field. So and I think some of the, the stick that, you know, a lot of people get and I think is a bit harsh. I think it's out of order. And I think a lot of people in society now jump on the bandwagon of, yeah, 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 yeah we shouldn't have women in football. So, like, you know, it's just stupid. What are you talking about? You know, like, how, how ridiculous are you? What are you going on about? You know, everyone's entitled to an opinion, you know, like... There's people that ain't played football and uh, are talking about football every week. Well, they're not allowed to talk about football because yeah. they haven't played the game. You know, like if they if they We're talk talking about, about the football YouTubers and fan channels, of and course, like that. right? And yeah. well, no one digs them out. You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah, Mark yeah. Goldbridge, he never played football. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he's got a brilliant following on YouTube or whatever, yeah. and you know, people respect what he says. You know, yeah. but you know, so what? Is any Luco or you know, all these people are not allowed to talk about football because what? Because they haven't played in the men's game. Fuck off. Mm. You know, I think it's out of order the stick they get. I think it's, I think it's nonsense, and I think it's just people trying to jump on the bandwagon of, you know, being jealous of the fact that these women have done brilliantly to get to where they've got to and have been successful. And I think a lot of them are really good. Um, so yeah, I mean, look, you, you, you do have to be. I, I'm. <laughs> well, I always try and stay in a comfort zone of if I don't know about it, I might, I'll say I don't know. Yeah. You know, like if if someone asks me a question about women's football, I'm not going to sit there and lie and say that I know. Yeah, it, yeah. You know. I think you've got to, you know, say, look, I don't know. You yeah. know, I haven't watched that game or, I, yeah. you know, you, uh, and I I always, I don't take, I think the best thing is to not take yourself too seriously. You know, like we, we're, we're, in, we're in the entertainment business. You know, I'm a pundit and I'm, you know, I talk about football, but I'm an entertainer as well. I want people to listen to my show and, or listen to me and I want people to smile and have a laugh and don't take yourself too seriously. You know, mm. no one really gives a shit. <laughs> like, you know, you know, like, we all just want to have fun and we want to enjoy life. I'm very much like, I just want to enjoy myself on the journey that I'm on. And I respect everyone who's got an opinion. I respect any woman or man or you know, anyone who's in the game who's doing well for themselves. Well done. Because mm. it's a tough industry to be in. Yeah. And you are going to take a lot of stick. You're going to get people moaning at you. You're going to get people saying you're not good enough. How are you talking about this? How are you talking about that? What's Jamie know? You know, he's, no, he's you know, like, I'm, I'm at the top of my trade in what I'm doing. And I get imposter syndrome. Right. Like I really do. Like I sit there and think I'm presenting Talksport Breakfast Show mm. to millions of people. Yeah. How the fuck has that happened? <laughs> you know, like seriously, I was like, you know, but you know, I get imposter syndrome because I'm not Stephen Gerrard. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not Frank Lampard. I'm not Jamie Carragher. Mm. You know. You know, I've had a good career, <clears throat> but I'm good at my job. I entertain and I, and I have a laugh with people and I can relate. People can relate to me and. You know, you, you got to, you know, it's a journey that you find yourself on. And if you're good at your job, you deserve to be there. And, you know, if you're not good at your job consistently, you don't matter who you are, you're going to get sacked off eventually. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm always very much like fair play to everyone who's doing well for themselves. I'm very much like, I I'm not jealous of anyone mm. that's doing better than me or getting opportunities that I, I, I haven't got. Worst investment you ever made? <sighs> Fucking hell. Ex-wife? <laughs> <laughs> Two million pound divorce, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> worst investment. I mean, I, I, I put 100 grand into a hotel once in Greece that never got built. <laughs> <laughs> was it one of those where it was never going to get built or it fell through? Uh, I think it was one that was never going to get built. Right, okay. <laughs> um, I put 30 grand into a cryptocurrency coin that never even existed. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was Those some good ones yeah yeah, yeah it was a bit of a disaster I actually got offered Bitcoin through my financial advisor before Bitcoin was Bitcoin yeah wow. and um, he offered me six thousand pounds worth of Bitcoin which was at the time about three four hundred Bitcoins wow okay yeah people listening will be quickly googling a conversion rate right now yeah that's a lot it, yeah. I mean we're talking worth a like lot. 50 60 million yeah uh, and uh, yeah that, that was one that I kind of think probably I mean, I'll never forget that phone call I was over, yeah, yeah. driving over Darver Bridge and I was on the phone to him saying look I've got divorced I've got some money I ain't got a lot 
Right, so I can't go and buy a house. Like, you don't, I can't put money into a property. But is there anything like <clears throat> that we could put something in that we might make a few quid? And he went, what about Bitcoin? <laughs> what the fuck is Bitcoin? <laughs> what are you talking about? He was like, cryptocurrency. I said, I don't know what you're on about. Yeah. No idea. I said, yeah. fuck, like, do me a favour. Go away. <laughs> And, thought, and sort yourself out and come back. He said, no, he said, I think you should put six grand into Bitcoin and just see what happens. He said, it might do all right, might not. But yeah, I think it's, it's people are starting to talk about it. Fucking hell. <laughs> I want to be sat here right now. I've been messing. <laughs> six grand into Bitcoin would have been worth millions. Yeah, yeah, Idiot. yeah. But yeah, I mean, look, I, I made some bad investments, bought some nice cars. <clears throat> At least you get some fun out of those. It's not like the hotel that was never going to get Yeah, done. yeah, yeah. I'm not bought a nice, I bought a white Bentley, which um, cost me 150 grand as a wedding present. Got divorced a year later. <clears throat> but I tell you what, that was, that was a, oh, what a car that was. Yeah. That was an unbelievable car to drive around in. Yeah, not um, a bit conspicuous. You've got to be careful where you park that, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I used to park it outside the, the pub. Uh, on up on the curb so everyone could see it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then realised I looked like a complete twat. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've made some made some bad investments for sure, but nothing that's ever really skidded me out complete, completely. Mm. Okay, before we end, I want to do a bit of like a, a bit of a quick fire. <clears throat> get your sort of like initial thoughts on, you know, or just some thoughts that come to mind on a, on a few people like names in 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 your industry. Um, Roy Keane, love him. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Says it how it is. And who can question him? It's Roy Keane. Okay. Jamie Carragher. I love him. As, I mean, brilliant. Um, I think he's he's funny. I think he, he knows what the audience wants. And again, he, you know, he's played at the, the highest level. Gary Neville. <laughs> I mean, I might say like, I love him to all of them. Like, I, I, <laughs> yeah, that's I, okay. Yeah, I love him. Is he going to control all of football media at some point, Gary Neville? I mean, he's going to try, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think he wants to try. Um, I think he's got a lot to say for himself in terms of non-football related stuff. And I always think like kind of stay in your lane a little bit. Um, and, you know, I think Carragher does that. I think Roy Keane does that. I think Neville tries to be like an MP, doesn't he? Well, he's, his latest podcast is stick to football, isn't it? It's almost like either him or someone in his team has been like, I know what'll work. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I think you kind of, I mean, look, fair play to him if you think you can take over and go different avenues, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go anywhere near stuff like that. You're just, you're just looking for a disaster. Mm. I'm not intelligent enough to talk about politics well, or anything In terms like. of getting cancelled, it's probably quite an easy way to yeah. have someone like that yeah. happen, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I just, yeah, you don't want to be going too far down that road. Stick to football. Um, I think it's brilliant, though. As a Spurs fan, Ange Postacoglu. Love him. Yeah. I mean, what a guy. Um, a, lot of, a lot of scrutiny come in when he took over the job, saying, is he the right man for the fit? And I used to, I'd done a podcast with some guys up in Scotland and they... They were big Celtic fans and they were like, he's, they used to buzz off him. They mm. loved him. And they were like, they were devastated when he left. So I kind of took it to be like, you know, this guy must be decent. You know, he's not a fool. This guy is not an idiot. Um, and he'd proven everyone right, you know? Yeah. You know, what a really good manager he is. And he just seems like a nice bloke and relatable. Yeah. You know, people can relate. And I think fans want, I think you've got to have someone you can relate to a bit. You know, you don't need a robot in charge of your football club. And mm. I think Tottenham needed to go back to basics a little bit. We went with Conte and Mourinho and, you know, big fishes. Um, and I think we've gone back to basics of knowing where we are. We're not Man City. We're not Liverpool. You know, but we are a decent football club and we've got a manager in there who's trying to take us to that level again. Do you think, <coughs> looking back on his time at Spurs and say three, four years time, it, you'll be just like massive success? I hope so. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it can turn sour at Tottenham very quickly, you know, but I think what he's, I think regardless of how his reign goes, I think it will be a success. I think because of the mentalities instilled in terms of with the fans and the football that we're playing, the entertaining nature and the kind of gung-ho mentality of attacking football. I think football fans, and especially Spurs fans, after watching, you know, some managers play some really boring football, I think they're just enjoying the moment. Mm. <coughs> are we going to win the title? Probably not. Mm. You know, like, are we going to win trophies week in, week out, like every season? Probably not. We're not. But we've got an incredible facilities and, and stadium and people, and, and now people are enjoying going down 
to watch Spurs again. You know, we're not ever going to be Man United. We're not going to be Liverpool. So let's go and at least go and fucking enjoy watching us play. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, this might come through a Spurs lens <coughs> a little bit, but Mikel Arteta? Overrated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's got a big job before he probably deserved that job because he was Pep's right-hand man. Um, I think he's a really good manager. Don't get me wrong. Right. You know, I'm not saying he's a bad manager. You know, a really good manager in terms of what he wants to instill in his team. But I think Arsenal spent a lot of money, mm. a lot of money, and they haven't got it done. Mm. You know, they haven't won, and they haven't. You know, they're not, they're not going to win. I think. I don't think. And I think when you're coming up against the Klopp, Unai Emery, I think Unai Emery is a way better manager. And you know, Pep Guardiola, I, I just think Arteta falls short. Okay, Ten Hag. I liked Ten Hag when he came in. I thought he had something about him—a disciplinarian. I think he had something about him, but I think he's lost the dressing room. He's fell out with too many players. Mm. I think he's tried to be too... I, I think Ten Hag would have been an amazing manager in, for, in the Alex Ferguson era of managers. Right, yeah. You know, my way or the highway. Mm. I think now with players, they go, all right, see you last longer. <laughs> highway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See you last longer. Right, okay, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Because the manager don't get results and you lose the dressing room, you're out the, you're out the door in six games. Yeah. If you're a player, you've got five-year contracts, eh? you, ain't, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah. So, man, so players are quite happy to see a manager off these days and been like, I ain't fucking playing for you. Mm. Look at Sancho. He's refused to play, refused to apologise to his manager, Man United. Who the fuck do you think you are? Like, this is what players are getting away with now. And I think Ten Hag's fallen foul of that, coming here and being like, this is how we're doing it. This is what we're doing. Bang, bang, bang. And I think a lot of players, he's lost in the dressing room because of it. Harry Maguire? (sighs) Fucking hell. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (coughs) I think he's done a brilliant job of getting the best out of his ability. Okay. But in terms of him being good enough to play for England or, or you know, being a, a Manchester United captain, oh, come on, you know, come on. <laughs> you know, he's a good player, he's yeah. a good player. Um, and he's had a decent career, but, you know, he's not, he wouldn't start at my England team. Mm. I think he's slow. I think he slows the game down. I think he puts his foot on the ball too many times. And I think when you come up against top quality, real top quality, I don't think he's good enough. Okay. To be look, he's he's better than me. <laughs> yeah, right. Do you know what I mean? In terms of the career he's had, that you know, that's not me being disrespectful to him because but just the level. But in terms of if I'm being having an honest opinion of where yeah. I think, you know, even Van Dyke, like, you know, no, you know, a million miles away from them. So obviously you're really enjoying what you're doing on the media side of things. Is there anything you haven't done yet that you'd love to do? Oh, that's a good question. Um what would I love to do? I mean, I think the ultimate goal in the future for me would be to host my own show, mm, okay. like a game show or something oh, of yeah. some sort. You know, like I look at like presenters now, um, like Bradley Walsh, I love, and you know, people like that. I think I'd love to in the future, you know, maybe, or a late night show, you know, like James Corden or something like that. Right, okay. You know, wow. I mean, you never know. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm reaching there. <laughs> oh, it's it's <laughs> you know, always good to have a goal like that. Yeah, and it? I think you've got to have a goal. And yeah, that's yeah. one, you know, I've always set goals and I try and set goals every single year now. Where do I want to be? Whether yeah. it's in three months, whether it's in six months, 12 months, five years, where do you want to be? And, you know, mm. if you get anywhere near that, you know, like I didn't think I would be hosting the breakfast show and talk sport, but yeah. I am. You know, I didn't think I'd be presenting a sports bar five days a week, but I am. But, you know, because I've manifested it and I was like, this is what I want to do. And I think it's key to constantly always have a goal in mind of where you want to be. A realistic target, you know, not, you know, I'm not going to go and manage Man United. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know, have a, you know, where do you think you could get to in this world? And I'd love to own a beach bar. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> a real one. Yeah, a real one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not one that's set up in, in the Greek islands. It's never going to get to see the light of day. Yeah. You know, but that's just me being, you know, having the the, the old oh. I have to be very careful of, I have two very different people on my shoulder. Right, yeah. You know, like the I have- The devil and the angel. Yeah, I have things. the devil and my angel who's like, right, yeah. Ibiza, <laughs> Dubai, move out there. 
you know, and open up a bar and, you know, like, like and it all sounds great, but the reality is, is it's not realistic, you know, but mm. um, I, I think I'm, when I'm focused on where I want to go in the future, yeah, I'd love to, you know, presenting now has become something that I feel like I've really settled into as a role and you know, I'm quite proud of myself, really, and you look yeah. at that, I've, you know, like 37 years of age, been on my ass really you know out of football it's not like I've had a you know this Steven Gerrard career where you can kind of have the choose to go wherever you want you know I've had to work at it and to get the opportunities at 37 to be doing presenting not many footballers out there who mm. present shows you know you've got Gary Lineker Jermaine Genus Robbie Savage you know, Alan Brazil who's done it for 20 years yeah and there's not many out there that present shows so that for me has been like something I'm really proud of over the last couple of years I've been able to do and I'm still learning, you know, I still want to get better. I, I listen back to my shows all the time to be like, where can I get better? Where can I? Do you find that painful? I find it hard I to listen back to myself. fucking hate my own voice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hate too. it. Yeah, you know, yeah, no wonder yeah. my missus is always having a at me. I, I <laughs> annoy myself, you know. It's painful. Like, I never watch, I, I really don't watch anything back. I don't like watching things back. But if you want to get better at yeah, something yeah. and you want to learn and you want to progress... You have to. Yeah. Where could I have been? And it's not. I'm not. I'm not listening back to listen to what I'm saying, you know, because that's just natural how it comes out. Mm. Well, what I'm listening back to is is how I've gone into a break or out of a break or you know, like how yeah. have you intro the show or what questions have you asked the guests? Could you have got more out of that interview? Mm. You know, that's something where you're like that. That really excites me now because that's all new to me. Yeah, that's something that's completely new where you can get better at. Fair. Well, Jamie, thank you very much for coming to speak with me. Really appreciate you taking time. If there's anywhere you want to send people or let them know about something up and coming, anything that, that well, comes to mind? Come around my house and have a couple of beers if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, you know, I, I think everyone knows where I'm at now on a yeah. weekly basis in, in talk sport and the sports bar, which is, you know, uh, an absolute, you know, uh, a godsend for me in terms of, uh, you know, really building my career. But um, yeah, I mean, I hope everyone just enjoys listening to a re a, the real talk of, of me and get a decent insight. I love doing things like this. Cause awesome. Well, I certainly do. I certainly like your uh, your insight. You say you say it how it is and not everyone does. So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. No, it's been a pleasure, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Cheers. I really enjoyed my conversation with Jamie O'Hara. We talked about so many things, but what did you think? Let me know in the comments below. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss a podcast episode. If you want to watch my full exclusive interview with Premier League legend Matt Letizio, you can check it out right here.